happened in the 90s. Uh... Matt was the fat kid, he was the flat kid. Life wasn't always great, but you know what was? The 90s happened in the 90s. Yeah! I am a matchmaker. What do you think? You want to take a protest drive? In your dreams, Patty. For every man, no. there's a woman. This isn't a humiliate the tourist scenario. No. For every woman. This is my bathroom. A man. You're welcome to join me if you like. And for every rule. Is being an idiot like being high all the time? <laughs> there's an exception. Janine Garofalo. No, 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 no. The matchmaker. <laughs> your laughter is really irritating me. <laughs> Rated R. Opens Friday at theaters everywhere. Matt, since we've been doing this show, has there been a thing that we've covered that you didn't care for, but, you know, as we talked about it, discussed it, it piqued your interest, and, and you found yourself liking it? I mean, honestly, I was ready to shit all over MacGyver. Uh, and even when I was watching it, I was like, eh, this is kind of iffy. But then once you, like, I got your take on it, too, and, like, dug deeper into it. MacGyver, I have to say, because I just remembered for whatever reason, I don't know, like I remember it being basically MacGruber, like it was basically that to me. It was that big of a joke, but I got to say, dude, what's that guy's name? Richard Dean Anderson? Is that his name? Richard Dean, yeah. RDA, killing the game. So I got to say MacGyver. What about you? Nice. Man, well, we didn't talk about it, but you know, something that came out recently, the anniversary at least, was Ace of Base Happy Nation. And back in the day, I never fucked with Ace of Base, really all the way up until like last week. And I was like, damn, they got some slappers. Ace of Base? All oh, that she wants is a little baby. Yeah. It, it takes you back to like a, that 90s club vibe on some MTV dance house type shit. Get your, your Alex Wright on. I saw the sign. Like that shit. My yeah. '90s guyness won't allow me to say I like Ace of Base, but those the songs you're mentioning, I'm not gonna turn them off if they come on. You know, the motherfuckers go hard. Don't even, don't even play, Matt. <laughs> and it's a beautiful life. Oh, oh, is a they, hey, that's, that's them. them. That's fucking. I'm what hey, I'm saying. Night at the Roxbury chicks. <laughs> Yo, dude, that can't be them. I'm looking that up. I'm looking it up, Steve. Man, it's something in that Sweden water, man. Oh, my. Okay. It is Ace of Base, Steve. Google has confirmed. Wow. Now that whole Chris Kattan fucking Will Ferrell skits seems even that much sweeter, Steve. See, that's... And, you know, the, the those songs I've heard growing up, but I just never associated them. I, I just didn't know who the artist was. Didn't care to listen. I was like, okay, I remember that jingle. It's it's pretty cool. But like, it's yeah, like, this bass. is the hits, 90s. Like, now that's music, 92. It never, you'd listen to it. Man, I thought that was like one of those, uh, pump it up. Like one of those bands from the early 90s, dude. <laughs> Like Marky Mark? <laughs> no, what was the one, dude? M. Oh, fuck, dude. There was my CC sister... Music Factory? Yeah, CNC Music Factory. Something like that, mm -hmm. I thought. Mm -hmm. Not mm -hmm. Ace of mm -hmm. fucking Bass with the banger, dude. Yeah, man. So, and the woman there, like, they, the female singers are sexy. I don't remember that at all. But I think it was like in the going back, if we just like take ourselves back to that time. If we would have admitted we liked Ace of Base as like during Ace of Base's reign, we would have been no. shredded to pieces, Steve. Because we didn't at the time. I think this is a more grown up take on Ace of Base. Like this is 40 oh, year old God. Steve appreciating like, damn, like because I as a teenager when that shit was coming out, I didn't like care to listen for the the beat, the music, which is melodic and the, the lyrics and all of that. Um, but you know, I so that was like Capri Sun, Steve, and now this is like Steve with the brandy snifter smelling the essence. <laughs> I respect it's... it. I mean, I now that I know that other song is theirs, 
that kind of flips me a little bit. I'm still not like straight up ace of base head, but um, wow, Steve, you're you're making you're a good. You should be a lawyer. You know, you're a regular Johnny Cochran over here, bud. Let's call our friend Larry the Shark. What was his name? We can never remember his name. <laughs> Dude, I had sucks because what a hero that guy was in our life. It was Larry, keep him around. wasn't it? It's, that's fucked up, though, because you don't know names, and then you just throw out a name and say the shark, and I'm like, well, the shark's right. I feel like it was Larry, though. It was like some scumbag white guy name, you know, because he, that guy probably wasn't the best person, but he helped us out. He's a lawyer. Yeah. yeah. And he saved our 18 year old lives. Like, man, we thought we were going to. Should we talk about this on the podcast? No, Maybe that's I mean, a Patreon. I just, you know, I'm just saying the man got us out of a little thingy thing, you know? Our freshman <laughs> year. We, only two weeks? I don't even know if it was that much into our, it our co- it collegiate not. career. Not even you a know, full two weeks. I'm out. Of, I'm out. You know, we're out time of our lives. You know how much stress that we had to endure? And that guy took it all away. I showed up and the guy was like the straight mob lawyer. He's like a gaudy lawyer. He's just like, don't even worry about it. He show up with $200. You're good to go. He might have defended Manson at one point. Like, yeah. I, I remember us both going from Bowling Green to Perrysburg. Perrysburg to Bowling Green. Oh, it's, damn it, it's not here yet. <laughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah, dude, those out. car trips, those stressed out car trips. God, how much gas did I waste? But yeah, dude, that guy, if he wasn't saving our ass, I wonder how many college kids that dude got out of, like, tickets. But I think here's what it is, Steve. Here's what it really is. Conspiracy time. That guy knew the cops, right? He's dealing with them all the time. So he's like, look, funnel me a couple. We're all gonna get, like, this is just endless money. Just bust these kids. It's not even gonna be anything. And we're, we're gonna make money off this, guys. That guy had, was on the take somehow. He was getting money off of it. And this was BG cops. So it was like, you know, throw them a couple food stamps and a hundred. They're good. Yeah, and a Blockbuster gift card because that was still a thing at the time, you know? Yeah. Damn, mom, well, that was a walk down memory lane. But yeah, I, I, I should need. I think Larry's right, man. And I, I wish I remembered the gentleman's name because, as a lawyer, as a litigator, as a law professional, the man was an artist, and I respect that. Shout out to the shark. You know, ever since we moved to the city, things sure are different. Yeah, more hectic. Crazy. Nothing is real. Yeah. Look at us. Well, look what I found. Farmhouse. Yeah, farmhouse. It's food that's delicious and natural. Kind of reminds me of home. Well, I feel better already. Let's eat. Farmhouse foods. Everyone can use a little farmhouse in their life. Don't be a pig. I resent that. Well, hey, boys and girls, this is Steve G and Maggie with Happened in the 90s, a show where we talk about what happened in the 90s. So get out your Dunkaroos and your Look Who's Talking Twos, because I smoke on the mic like smoking Joe Frazier, the hell raiser, raising hell with the flavor, terrorize the jam like troops in Pakistan, sweeping through your town like the neighborhood Spider-Man, ta la tick-tock, keep ticking. Damn. Where'd you find that, son? Watch your steps, son. Watch your steps, son. But protect your neck. Come on, Matt. Show me that smile again. Well, today, my friend, we're talking about all things November 9th in the 90s, son. Uh-uh. Starting off in 1990, Child's Play 2 premieres. While Andy's mother is admitted to a psychiatric hospital, the young boy is placed in foster care, and Chucky, determined to claim Andy's soul, is not far behind. Directed by John Lafia, starring Alex Vincent, Jenny Aquiter, Garrett Graham, Christina Lee, Grace Sabrisky, and Brad Dourif. Hey, Andy. Brad Dourif, just a legend that if you actually, you would never know if you saw him on the street. But uh, you wouldn't. This is a franchise that I didn't like as a kid. It actually terrified me as a young child when I saw the first one. But as it's, you know, matured and as I've grown old, this is such a fun. Uh, franchise as a whole even it's still continuing it's that strong but but nothing beats the originals uh unlike you matt i was a weird kid i guess because 
when I stayed with my dad, when he was stationed in Virginia over the summer, I had his girlfriend who would eventually become his, his wife, uh, take me to the rental place and re rent child's play the original. And you I would watch it man. over and I, I just, I don't know. It's something about these dolls that could talk. You know, I, I had ventriloquist <laughs> dolls. I wanted to be the, the black Jim Henson as a kid. Cause I loved me some Muppets, even if they killed people. And, and Chucky, I, I gotta say, if, if I gotta make a Mount Rushmore, it would be Freddie, Jason, Michael, Chucky. And it, that's the '80s baby, the '90s kids speaking in me. Maybe some of those boomers would have Frankenstein and the Mummy or some shit. And, and maybe some of these new Gen Z people would probably say uh, the, the "it clown" or uh, "jigsaw" or something. But like, nah, that's my four. See, I agree with the four, but I would put Freddy, Chucky, Jason, Michael Myers, and I get it. There's pure like. The, the slasher movie history and who was there first and whatnot, but I'd like a villain with some pizzazz, Steve. I like a guy with some personality and Freddie and Chucky, Chucky too. He's, I mean, it's a satanic killer soul inside of a doll that also throws some zingers at you. And he's not, he won't hesitate to call someone a bitch, uh, which coming out of a doll is hilarious. It's just like when kids cuss and maybe I'm saying that because I don't have kids, but it will never not be funny to me. And this is actually considered one of the best the, or actually the best in the whole franchise, Child's Play 2. It's, it's got a cult following like a lot of these movies do, man. Um, and I remember once this was on like the Showtimes and HBOs for those monthly free trials, I would watch the fuck out of them, man. I always, to me, the be the one that I gravitate to the most and can rewatch the most is the third one, because <clears throat> it's kind of wackier looking, and uh, it also they get another like kind of innocent kid involved in it. They, I think it's in a military bit camp. Yeah. And there's like a young black kid that it happens upon Chucky in the middle of it, but there's good like violence in it. Like he goes around like I remember he like slashed an asshole like barber's neck and it was like kind of freaky and stuff but um i think there's it also is that the one where he gets glued like in the factory i believe that's this one. one. Oh, that's this one see i'm where his head blows up yeah hell yeah <laughs> maybe i'm thinking of this one now too the, to it's... be honest with you i think i am because it ends in a toy factory ends in this toy factory yeah, man and, uh, dude, hell he gets yeah. his legs sawed off and he's like on a cart and he's like, like dragging himself on the cart, coming towards Andy. That shit is hilarious. You like, son of a bitch. I, cussing his ass off. I love that. Who oh. was, who created this? Is it one of the, like, who's the director of these? Is it somebody? Uh, the, di the director of this one is John Lafia, but he wasn't the director of the original. Oh, the creator of Chucky, they nailed that. Even just the, because this could have been stupid as fuck. And I mean, on, there's points of it, like you said, where he's like destroyed and stuff and he's crawling and he's basically like a little Terminator skeleton coming at him and stuff. It's wacky, but I don't know. Then I think also it was Brad Dorif. Like his voice acting made it like a yeah. little better than it could have been. If you just had some chud doing it, you know, because that dude is a ledge for sure. He definitely adds to it, man. Uh, but on that same day in 1990, Guns premieres. After a failed assassination attempt on her partner, DEA agent Donna Hamilton discovers that the crime lord responsible for her father's death is coming after her and her associates. Directed by Andy Sedaris, starring Eric Estrada, Donna Spear, Devin DeVasquez, Danny Trejo, Cynthia Brimhall, and Chuck McCann. Eric Estrada joint, dude? Chips? From, from the chips, yeah. And uh, Matt, this is available on Tubi. It's worth a watch because <laughs> you got guns and you got titties. <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, the title alone, it's got my it's guns, dude. But an Estrada joint and a young Trejo. How's Trejo looking in this? Uh, man, he he's he's the heavy um, or, or one of the henchmen. He's Eric Estrada's henchman. And, you know, Eric Estrada is like El Jefe and like he he killed one of the DEA agent's dads and he's coming back to kill her. 
and, and not just her, the whole organization, because he's pushing weight, he's pushing guns, and Estrada, you know, dude, fucking taking he's, a turn. He's doing the most, and this is actually a part of a series. The director Andy Sedaris uh, is a fucking genius, and quite possibly a dirty old man, but uh, you know that's neither here nor there. Hey, uh, you know, this is a part of his BBB series, the Bullets, Bombs, and Babes, or bullets bombs and boobs and he was notorious for having this rotating acting list of former penthouse playmates and playboy playmates um because like i said it's got titties in this and <laughs> all the women all the women are fine okay. like fine so like this isn't just eye candy on the cover here with this these voluptuous lady okay this looks like an old like Pam Greer women in prison movie, honestly. But in the 90s. Yeah. Looks like the movie that uh Samuel L's watching at the beginning of Jackie Brown. <laughs> AK47. Otis Sam. When you gotta kill every motherfucker in the room, <laughs> except no substitutes. I love my Glock 75. <laughs> Da, 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 da. I mean, this you know it looks like a movie penthouse released but this was a real movie oh, with estrada in it and a young danny trejo which i love and it also has a promising or was promising athlete named john brown he was a highly touted freshman running back uh and he was going to be the number one pick in 1990 uh for the houston oilers he ignored his agent's advice and decided to take a small meaningless role in this movie and he made a kick through the door and the stunt effects team had failed to swap the breakaway panel he basically had a uh the what's the guy from wcw the fucking <laughs> Oh, he's shockmastered it, Steve. Shock! He, he's shockmastered. So he basically like tore his ACL, his MCL, and his Achilles and his kneecap. And after six years of rehabilitation, he ended up playing two games as a backup for the Edmonton Eskimos. John oh, Brown was his name. John yeah. Brown, dude, you got fucked up for being in an Eric Estrada movie. I mean that that ain't great, yeah. you know. Like, damn though, you got. Can the man get some money from the production company? I mean, damn, you ruined this man's life. But lifetime supply of penthouse. A pretty decent movie with some titties, Steve. So at least he has that. Huh. He's like, I was that one day on set. It was best day of my life. Man, guns and titties, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> but also in 1990, Dances with Wolves premieres. Lieutenant John Dunbar, assigned to a remote Western Civil War outpost, finds himself engaging with a neighboring suit settlement, causing him to question his own purpose. Directed by Kevin Costner, starring Kevin Costner, Mary McDonald, Graham Greene, and Rodney Grant. But this is kind of a weird, slow movie that I think has like a really bad name because it's kind of a questionable story, but... A young Matt really thought that the uh, Native American lady in it was very hot, and I can remember that part of it. First time watching it over the week, man. And, uh, you know, I had time, because this thing, it requires time to watch. It's it's over three hours. It's long. And, uh, like, it's epic, man. I get it. Like, I don't understand why it beat Goodfellas um, or why it was nominated for 12 nominations or nominated for 12 awards, it won seven, including Best Picture and Best Director. I could but... see like it winning a cinematography award because there's a lot of like for sure. sweeping, gigantic like landscape shots, like war sure. battles and stuff because this is around the time of Civil War. So like, I think Costner's like a Civil War dude or a guy yeah. in that army in that time period. And he, he basically like defects and becomes part of this like tribe of Native Americans and stuff. So he has like a romance. I remember, isn't Oliver Platt in this? Is there No, some... I don't believe so. Who's uh, the... Charles Rocket. I, I noticed Charles Rocket was in this. Uh, he's one of the guys that uh, Kevin Costner defected from. And, you know, they look at him as a turncoat. So Charles Rocket, he I know him from SNL. He was the guy that got fired after dropping the F-bomb in the early 80s. I want to know who the fuck did it. Um, <laughs> they, they did like a Dallas spoof in that episode. But, um, yeah, I, I immediately recognize him, but as far as other recognizable faces, I didn't see any. There's other. a guy who's like chubby that gets shot up. He has like a wagon in it. 
and he gets like shot up by some Indians. I, th- I feel like it's, it's some like chunky. I remember him being an actor in the nineties and I think it's Oliver Platt, but regardless, um, I just remember like my parents were hell of into this. Maybe it was cause it was Costner. Cause you gotta go back. Costner's killing the game at this point. He can't be, he you, know, un, you know, untouchables. Like he's been in a lot of good shit and I still love me some Kevin Costner, but I don't, the memories I have of this are like not based on the movie being good at all. It's about the chick being hot, me being into that and going, watching this movie multiple times to see her in the movie as a young kid. But you know, I do remember the cinematography. <laughs> I, and I agree the cinematography of the landscape, man, the, the wide shots that they use. Um, and, and overall it wasn't a bad flick. I just don't know if I could do that again. You know, because it's three hours plus. When I just want I question uh, like an Oscar, you know, like it's a good movie, but it's like there's a lot of movies like this. Like, did Glory win a a fucking Oscar? Because it like way better than this. Um, And uh, if you pit this up against fucking Goodfellas, like, God damn, like the just not even close. I don't know. But I think also, Steve, I have a bias because I don't like movies set in this time period. I find them boring for the most part, you know? That's fair. That's fair. And, uh, but also, uh, Denzel actually did win for Glory. That was his first, uh, Oscar. He won for Best Supporting. So there was that. But, um, in 1991, Growing Pains is airing season seven, episode nine, The Big Fix. Ben uses and hurts the vacuum cleaner Maggie's supposed to test for her column. She doesn't know what he did, so when it runs poorly, she prepares to blast the company for misleading advertising. Meanwhile, Luke lies about his life to a girl he wants to impress. Oh, Luke. You You just don't know. You just don't know. Yeah, I mean, if both, if that, you know, if Susie could just put herself in the future, I'm like, oh my God. I turned him down. I don't know. But I gotta don't say, know. I didn't, you know, I remember this when Ben Seaver was a young kid. You know, I remember that time period of growing pains. And I gotta say, a Ben Seaver centric episode of this show is not a sh- is not an episode of growing pains that you want to watch, Steve. That's fair. I, I don't. The guy creeps me out. <clears throat> the whole the whole shebang is just a, a debacle in and of itself. But um, I will before I shit on it or even just like make fun of it. Uh, this show's theme song, we talked about Perfect Strangers, and this is right there. The, that part of it, it has cemented it in the lexicon. Perfect Strangers, it, it's got some separation from Growing Pains, but I get what you're saying. It's Because it's pretty epic, too. As long as we got each other. <laughs> that fucking sleigh right there getting on the neck on the solo, Steve. That it's just it's vintage like 80s 90s uh you know gold basically and it's got an alan thick that regardless of anything else i'm not going to besmirch that man rest in peace to a legend never the man's lineage is you know making grammys and whatnot and uh he's one of the coolest like tv dads of all time i gotta say cool you know like nate dog said i can't deny it and uh, Ben's going to the movies, uh, but Jason, he wants him to break the leaves. Maggie wants him to rake the leaves. Do something around this damn house. Stop Just... being so nerdy, Ben. Stop yeah. jerking off in the fucking bathroom all the time. I didn't know Ben Seaver had a friend, but he wants to go see some fucking horror movie uh the you know, sounds like it's in the le- like basically the same along the lines of what we were just talking about. But yeah, he ain't raking the leaves. He's got to stick around. And uh, his what's his guy? What's the dude's name? What's his buddy's name? Vince. Kenny. His uh, Kenny. And, and that's played. Yeah, played by uh, Le- Levar. I think his name Levar something. Shavar Moss. Shavar Ross. And he was also Weasel on Family Matters. He was Waldo's buddy, and he got incorporated into the the, the clique with Eddie and Steve, and they all, all became friends. Damn. Well. Okay, so he made it out of this, but he comes over and is like, dude, like, I'll, you know, why are you using a fucking rake? 
you got a fucking vacuum cleaner over there. You can just flip a couple of switches, take a circuit board out. It's this whole long, you know, it sounds kind of complicated. He's like, you do this, turns it into a fucking leaf blower. You're good to go. And uh, Ben does that. And this is where we see him being a complete dweeb, to use 90s terminology. He's like talking to himself, playing weird games while he's blowing leaves. And to be honest with you, this kid's going to be doing like that LARPing shit where he's like playing Final Fantasy in a park with some buddies. That's on the level of what he's doing. But, you know, Kenny hooks it up because that shit does work, Steve. Yeah, not until later. Uh, but now, I mean, it, it needs to be fixed because Ben puts that shit up on the garbage can and it just breaks, just falls into the garbage can and just breaks. It seems like a cheap piece of shit. So well, also it felt like if you watch after it, because it falls in, I mean, and what it like almost explodes, it goes into some crazy, like fucking zappy shit with some electricity, but whatever is in the garbage can, it's like falls into a bunch of water. So what do you got? Are you collecting fucking fresh rainwater and shit savers? What's going on? Are you doomsday prepping? I don't get that. But I mean, dude, if you're going to fuck around with your mom shit, don't tip it over on what I assume is a giant garbage can full of water that it might fall in. You just might fuck it up, you know? Pretty irresponsible, Ben. Yeah. I didn't remember that the Seaver's mother, and maybe this is like a later season thing, that she's like a, a product reviewist. She's a, yeah. you know, she'll review new products for, uh, the, I guess, the local newspaper. I suppose get getting her Ralph Nader on in the Long Island streets, but like I, I wasn't as tapped into Growing Pains as I was some of these other sitcoms. Uh, maybe it was a, a later edition. I, I do know she was fucking. They got what four kids. I know that that she was doing that. <laughs> she was uh, fucked, dude. I knew that. I'm protected. <laughs> I'm tall and thick, dude. You can't. You gotta. You gotta keep all that you can. You know what I'm saying. Mikey. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I was just like, these was like a syndicated show that was on a lot that I remember the theme song and it has like a special place in my heart because I must have watched it with like my grandma. But as I'm watching it, I was like, I didn't remember. I didn't even remember fucking what's his face's name. Mike Seaver. That was like a big name back in the day. And I completely forgot what? about that. Him and um, his buddy Boner. <laughs> Boner. Was there really a guy named Boner, Steve? That was his buddy. They called him, his name was Boner. Blackie. <laughs> That's the second coming of that. We're back with Blackie. <laughs> I'll never get over that. But, um, so, you know, apparently this woman's got to review um, a vacuum cleaner. This specific vacuum cleaner, Steve, to give us some shine to our old, like, stomping grounds. It's a Toledo vac, Steve. This is, we're besmirching the town with a glass city here with this shenanigans. That, man, I overlooked that, man. Uh, well, they fucking say it a lot, but the vax fucked up. She has to review it. And <clears throat> Ben's freaking out, rightfully so. And he doesn't, again, this is just classic TV trope. He just doesn't tell her right away. He gets fucking Kenny to come over and make some repairs. <laughs> hey, Kenny's in the union, apparently. Like, he's like 17, 18, and he's in the union. I don't know. <clears throat> they start him early. Well, the motherfucker is, he does not, like, he at least, he's a good con artist, if nothing else, because he's like, give, he's like, yeah, that thing, this thing. I'm mean, like, oh, okay, clearly you know what you're talking about. Fix it. Um, but, you know, Kenny, he comes over with some tools. He, he bangs on it gets it to like at least turn on he's like you're good to go so he's gonna be a great like tv some kind of like car mechanic or something so looking, yeah you're good it was just the plug. On craigslist <laughs> yeah but uh I, you sure it's not tornado vacuum i dude i'm telling you it's he's... gotta be toledo if it's not then i was on a lot of drugs when i watched this and that wasn't the case oh well i know i was uh, but hey, oh, uh, the smaller scenario here, Luke, he comes into the kitchen and he needs to talk to Mikey. He, need, he needs to have a one-on-one -on -one session. He, he wants some uh, 
older bro advice. And, you know, you, you need the sister to get up out of here. Yeah, scat, skedaddle. And, and uh, he, there's this girl named Susie Maxwell in school that he's got the hots for. And he's 15 and he's never been on a date. And he's nervous. She makes him sweat in places he didn't even know he had glands. I don't like that line, Reed, but... Uh, you know, shout out to Luke, who's a young Leonardo DiCaprio to all those uninitiated. Uh, Leo's getting his start. Um, didn't really, I remembered he was involved, Steve, but I don't remember why he was adopted until I think Kendra filled me in that Mike at this point is a substitute teacher and Luke was a student of his who was homeless. Correct this young handsome homeless kid adopted by the Seavers now he wants Mike to you know how do I get into them draws Mike how do I do it I never been on a date Mike's like look it's easy women are dumb they're fragile (laughs) he's just gives the most 90s advice he doesn't say dumb but he's like they're fragile creatures and his sister's not five feet away from him, just looking at him, staring daggers at him. And they like talking about themselves. And then that's when his sister's like, hold up. Well, I don't do that. And I stay there. Exactly. I'm proving my point. And I, I want to call out Susie Maxwell, played by Danielle Harris. She is one of those girls that just popped up on all the TGIF shows. On uh, She was on Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead. She was in a lot of 90s related projects that we have seen. But, you know, I think she was just not on the radar because she she never had like a a regular vehicle. She would just be on for an episode of Full House or Home Improvement or maybe Family Matt. I don't know. But she was all over these ABC streets. She looks like a young Jennifer Love Hewitt, honestly. She's got those back. I can see that. Um, I don't remember like being on all those shows, but... That tracks. I mean, I mean, I hate to say this, but she just looks like a basic white chick. So, you know, she's got some pizzazz enough that Luke's into it. Um, and now he's got some advice, too. He's got some 90s advice from Mike Seaver, the ladies man, Steve. Mikey mm-hmm. Mike. Yeah, man. And lo and behold, Mike could probably use some advice from Luke now. But back at the Seaver household, Maggie's testing the vacuum and it's not sucking. And that sucks. It's supposed to, it's it's not supposed doing to suck a 20 pound fucking bowling ball up off the ground, Steve, which god damn. It's like a golf ball to a garden hose. That's it's too powerful. Like... They would that sounds too powerful anyway, but it ain't hitting like that. Cause whatever Kenny did do to it, it ain't sucking a bowling ball up. It's about how you know it's it's not even sucking dust up, Steve. So what the it's fuck? Dud. <laughs> yeah. And Ben tries to step in like, hey, you know, it's not like our, our carpet is full of bowling balls anyway. <laughs> it's, a, it's a vacuum. We ain't supposed to pick up vacuum bowling balls. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, try some other stuff out. Try try some of that dirt. And she's like, eh, it's not picking up the dirt. So it's like, oh, uh, well, shit. So now I'm going to write a scathing review of this fucking product. And Ben's like, well like maybe give it a second chance or like what if you get sued and she's like we're not gonna get sued this thing sucks and then back at luke's little miniature date he's talking to Susie maxwell and he as the kids would say he's capping hi Cap'n. Uh, he's like yeah my dad he he was on the american team or no that's what that's what she says after he says like yeah i i lived on the sea because my dad owns a yacht and, and it, it's big than a motherfucker and so is my dick and and I, I climbed Mount Everest and this, that, and the third. Would you believe that I'm a Mulgravian prince? In exile. <laughs> yeah. I got I got a fortune. And she's she's uh, she's like, I'm not dumb. Okay. And he's like, and he throws a couple more lies, and she he's like, Well, what do you think? And she's like, I think you're a fucking piece of shit. And she just leaves, Steve. You phony. You fucked up. That's what get, that's what lying gets you guys. Remember that. Look at Leonardo's. Look at Leo DiCaprio's disappointed face in this scene. You can barely see it's it behind dis- Steve, but I'm gonna cut to it. This is what lying gets to you, and he learns. And then he gets to get pussy crew, Steve. He'll never look back. 
I swear, if I could get in that DeLorean and just go and tell this young child, man, look, dude, she don't know and you don't know, but I'm about to tell you, you're about to be a part of the Get Pussy crew with your buddy who's going to be Spider-Man. And that's all the flex you should need. Don't even worry about it. Your life, gold. Solid gold. Mr. On out, bud. Mr. Titanic, Wolf of Wall Street. <laughs> If Kirk Cameron comes at you and says anything about not doing that stuff, don't listen to him. You're going to be fine. In 20 years, look at IMDb and look under your name and look under his name. <laughs> if he gives yeah. you any advice, just laugh at him. Yeah, it doesn't Kirk Cameron just make like straight to DVD fucking Jesus movies now? Produced by Pat Robertson or some shit. Yeah. <laughs> the Second Coming, starring Kirk Cameron. <laughs> Jesus loves his children. And then now Ben is telling Maggie, hey, let's get the tornado back another chance. You know, maybe that, that was just the first time thing, you know. It's it's not let's not just give up on it yet. Well, and she now, gets she gets a new one delivered because she's she I guess maybe she like listened to Ben initially. Now she gets a new one delivered and she's like, Look, got a new one, tip top. There's no excuses if this shit doesn't work now. She goes in to like set the fucking bowling ball down or whatever ben comes in with kenny they see the vacuum and he's like hey look dude fucking this thing sucks not knowing it's been replaced like this is not the one that you fucked up and he's like yo kenny this shit wasn't working so you gotta fucking jack this thing up and kenny performs like a tim the toolman taylor power upgrade I, like a, he puts a coupling on like i don't know he does High something power. steve we don't know but then, you know, Ben's mom comes in, Maggie, and she's like, okay. It's like, well, you know, mom, you should give this thing a shot, like you said. And she goes, well, that was the plan. And now we take this vacuum cleaner into a living room, Steve. And um, I think it happens off screen. Like, I think Ben and Kenny are like, he, they're just like sort of talking about it. And then we hear a scream. Yeah. And uh, the goddamn vacuum cleaner is about to suck the wall off of the house. Steve, it's, it's gone yeah. nuclear. And it takes most of the Seaver family to pull the vacuum off the wall and leaves a big chunk off. And Jason's not going to like that because he has to clean it up. Mikey, why aren't you going to help me? I wish I could do a better Alan Thick. I mean, how, how do you do an Alan Thick? I don't know. Mike. It's like radio voice, but I can't do it. It's like, too, I'm not yeah. sexy enough. You have to be handsome enough to do that. It's a certain level required, yeah. And, uh, you know, now Mikey, he comes to his father. Like, Luke came to him. Pause. And he wants to know, like, hey, man, I think I gave Luke the wrong advice. Uh, he thought that I told him to lie to this girl. He ended up lying to the girl, and, and now he looks bad. So what should I do now, Dad? And, you know, Jason Seaver gives that great ABC fatherly advice. He's just like, you know, Luke, he has to be accepted for who he is. He has to accept himself first. Uh, you know, he's the best. He's literally is one of the coolest dads. Gives great advice. Now Mike's get on a mission to help out his boy, his little homie. This is crazy though that he was a teacher. I didn't like that. Is he's basically this kid's dad? You know what I'm saying? In a roundabout way. But uh, his I love that he told the kid to lie to the chick. He's like, look, lie to her. It's fine. Tell her you're a king of fucking Sahib. You just got thrown out. It's fine. But, um, you know, Maggie now is on a mission um, to tell everybody about this, this vacuum cleaner because it either doesn't work or it almost sucks your baby into a fucking, into hell. To the and seventh portal. <laughs> I believe that her... Uh, her boss shows up if i'm not mistaken at this point yeah and he's played by peter jurassic i don't know do you recognize peter i that, don't recognize uh, him but his name is legendary and i love that that that's roy from problem child the uh the cantankering neighbor no way that's, yeah wait is that the one that he he uh put the the projection of the the babysitter fucking no. on his house no roy is uh the world's greatest dad they went oh, on a camping yeah. trip that's, <laughs> dude it's, it's that's that guy him? 
That's him. Yeah. Wow. Making the rounds. Okay. Well, he tells Maggie, he's like, look, your article, scathing. Amazing. Can't do it. But can't run it. She's like, wait, what? And he's like, look, um, Toledo Vac, they're a subsidiary of the company that owns us. Uh, they will not want us to say anything about this. So I'm tanking this. And, uh, you know, thanks for the effort. Appreciate it. Bye. <laughs> and she doesn't take that well, Steve. She takes that personally. But, hey, she got to keep the, getting those paychecks. And by, back in Luke world, he finally comes clean. And, you know, Susie Maxwell, she finds out. And she tells him, like, look, I, I just want to be able to like you. I need to know about you. How am I going to like you if I don't know about you? You're giving me this, this facade, this, this fictional Luke. I want to know the real Luke. Um, well, bitch, I'm about to be one of the biggest stars ever in Hollywood. Um, <laughs> just, just wait and watch. Bye. But at this Bye. point, just so you know, I used to be homeless and he lets her in on that, Steve, because Mike did tell him that he has to tell her the truth. Mike took Luke. I, I, this was very cute. This is a fun way to do this where he's like, he tells him he gave him bad advice. Right. And then he's like, look. You, you got to just tell her the truth. And Luke's going, well, she's not even going to talk to me ever again because she thinks I'm a lying piece of shit. And then Seaver pulls out. He's like, look, I got this on deck. And it's like a fake Mulgravian secret. Or no, he he's like, look over there. Susie comes in because he got her over here and he gave her like a Mulgravian birth certificate or something to connect yeah. them again, Steve. And I think that was very adorable. Um, Looking out. Yeah, he's, he's trying to help his boy out. And uh, once he tells Susie about the homeless thing, she's like, she's into it. She's like, where'd you stay at? Where'd you sleep at? And she's pretty cool with it, you know? Proving once again, just don't tell lies. Just tell the chick, be, be forthright. Maybe she'll be, she's like, you know what? Maybe we should go hang out on the streams. Totally, yeah. <laughs> you don't have parents? You seem dangerous, oh my God. <laughs> Do you do any drugs out there? Do you know where to get those? <laughs> but, uh, but how did they introduce? So he was just like on the show once and he was just a homeless kid in the class and Mike Seaver's like adoption. <laughs> he became that caring because I've watched the, the second part of it. It started off as a two parter and he was his student and he found out through the grapevine. I can't remember how that he didn't have a home uh, because Luke was lying to Mikey. And like Mikey found out somehow, some way, and you know, he was just being that considerate, caring teacher on some Michelle Pfeiffer and, and dangerous minds type shit. Like, look, I have a student, he doesn't have a home, and blah, blah, blah. And Jason and Maggie, they were apprehensive about it at first because, you know, they were, they thought he was stealing shit because they had some stuff missing. And <laughs> yeah, this little bastard stealing out of my wallet. So, yeah. but did, so did the parents adopt him or did Mike Seaver adopt him? I believe the parents took him in. I mean, it's their house. So what in the white privilege is going on in this family? There's this kids adopt, having his parents adopt kids. The mom's reviewing products for, for newspapers and making money off this shit. What is Alan Thicke doing? Just being handsome? He's a psychiatrist. He's oh, Dr. Jason Seaver. Okay, there you go. There you go. There's my. That's my read. Alan Thicke. That's as good as it gets. That's as baritone as I can get. Show me that smile again. Now, <laughs> Maggie, she's got Channel 19 in the living room, live at 5. And Ben, right before they go to air, finally tells Maggie. And she's like, motherfucker, you. I'm beat and your go. <laughs> Like, I love yeah, she's just dumbfounded the whole you know the lady's like, so tell us about this killer vacuum cleaner. And uh quickly Maggie has to just basically pull a U-turn, Steve, and this turns into like not a a kill piece. This is like an infomercial for Toledo Vac. Cause this shit works. It's, this shit is tip top. Cause they were even like hyping it up, like, yeah, I'm gonna talk some. Big shit on this vacuum, man. Fuck that company. I'm mean, like, damn, y'all ain't shit. Y'all about to be bankrupt. Uh, right, right? No, we about it's to like that intro brother. that news channels do where they're like, this tonight at six, the product that's waiting to kill your child. 
<laughs> like, yeah, they, <laughs> and they couldn't wait. And then once she demonstrates the vac, it's actually sucking up bowling balls. It, it's sucking up the whole horse left coke on that little rug that they had. A little demonstration. It's of, not of Tony a drop Montana. Of, there's no dust left on this thing. This thing works great. And the, the anchor's like, yeah, but uh, probably fucking way too expensive, right? <laughs> like, what are you doing to me, bitch? What are you doing? Right. It's not what we're here for. This is supposed to be trash TV, damn it. Yeah, this is so, fucking, uh, you know, tonight at nine. This isn't the tonight at nine. The vacuum cleaner works great. That's not, it's not <laughs> going to get anybody to watch, you know? We want to know about vacuum sucking out fetuses. And then, like, so the, the review, it wasn't scathing. It, it, it was actually, like, a, a good look for the, the vacuum company. And so the TV news reporters, they all leave. And Ben's just like, all right, no harm, no foul, right? <laughs> you know? Uh, and then Maggie's just like, you know, I think the punishment should fit the crime. So she has this motherfucker rake all of Long Island's leaves, basically, in the, in the last scene. Because I, I don't know where he is. Because... <laughs> It's like purgatory. It's just like a flat football. Uh, from what we can see, like y hundreds of yards of just leaves, endless leaves, Steve. He's going to be an old and man before he gets done. This is some kind of fucking crazy torture, honestly, but rightfully so. The kid's a chud. You got Mike. You got a young Leo that's fucking, he's just jumping over Ben. Just keep him. Or maybe even say he is Ben. Yeah. You know? Figure it out. I mean, it's, it's the last season, so they're like, yeah, we don't really need a, this extra child in the in the house anyways. Go write these leaves to the end of the season. The end <laughs> of the series. That's his story for the rest of the show. It's just like, hey, where's Ben at? <laughs> they just show him still, like, starving to death. He's all gone and shit, raking leaves. Yeah, fuck him. His, <laughs> his glasses are all jagged. In a, but in 1993, R. Kelly, the Kells, releases 12 play and the world was not the same ever again. Because your body is calling me, mine is, oh, 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 so good, it had a sequel and a threequel. This guy loved to have, like, volumes, you know, he liked the number, he liked the numerical order to his albums. And not like that trapped in the closet thing. That had like 80 volumes. Man, he never, he he never creates storylines. Man, I, I lifted the R. Kelly band. I'm just going to say it. Fuck it. I, 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 I play this album from beginning to end. And damn, this shit jams. He is the king of R&B. Sorry, Luther. I'm sorry, Marvin. Yes, Robert Kelly. And this is the one that has all of the fucking essential R. Kelly shits from the 90s. Your body's calling me, bumping grind. Uh, see, I'm wise and I'm too no. I mean, uh, here's the thing. You know, I listen to, I you turn your car on, the radio's on, right? I still hear Michael Jackson music out there. I still hear a bunch of people that probably did some crazy shit in their life. And to me, there's Robert Kelly, the man, and then there's R. Kelly, the music, this artist. And that's what I choose to do because I've never really had a band on it. It's just like, you know, it sucks to be like, oh, this guy's kind of a creep, but the music speaks for itself, you know? <laughs> like, music, yeah, I, I could still fuck to it. It doesn't get me soft. I, I just... Uh, it just, it's... I, there was something going on in the 90s with R&B with R in general, because this show has, if nothing else, opened up a world of music to me that I never thought that I would be listening to at this point in my life, so much so. And this is another version of it, like the Bobby Browns and stuff, but this guy, he elevated past Keith Sweat, elevated past all these people that we know and love, the genuines of the worlds, and he was out there for decades until... Unfortunately, some allegations came out, but the music is good. And I don't see nothing wrong, Steve. With a little I don't see. It was some R. Kells on the fucking playlist. 
And like, my question is, what about the parents of these of these girls? Like, why aren't they locked up? I, I saw that escaping R. Kelly or whatever the hell it was called. And one of the parents, they're like standing outside of the window of where their daughter is supposedly where she's at. And the dad and the mom were there. And the dad's just like, yeah, there she is. You could throw a rock to where that girl was inside that building. And I'm just like, why? It's not like the building is surrounded by a moat and fucking a mass of water. Also, like, you're an adult, okay? If I have a kid, right? Whatever. If I have a kid, that what was the age of the girl at the time? 13, something like Early that? teens. Whatever. You got a 12, you got a 13 year old kid, whatever. And some adults like, Hey man, I want to hang out with your kid, but you can't be there. If anything happens past that, you should definitely, if anyone's arrested, you get, you're on the list. The other people can get arrested too, but you definitely, you got to be there because you've made a decision yeah. that's like, you didn't, what do you think they were going to do? Fucking play Parcheesi in a room together. It's not, he's fucking R Kelly. Okay. He's not like, singing about who? playing fucking <laughs> Candyland, okay? There's no reason. Hey, hey, Matt, pretend you're R. Kelly and I'm the dad of one of the girls that he wants to take on tour. At, like, ask me, can, can your daughter come? Let's... Hey, hey, man, what's up, man? Hey, Robert. <laughs> At this point in the show, Steve and Matt went on a five-minute rant that was very insensitive. For that reason, we've chosen to remove it. Please enjoy the rest of the show. Um, but I don't want to even talk about it. Let's talk about the music, which, I mean, it's Panty Dropping 101. Throw on some R. Kelly. At least it was in the 90s, you know? When your body's calling me. And also in 1993, the greatest hip hop group of all time, Wu-Tang Clan releases their debut, Enter the Wu-Tang 36 Chambers. I grew up on the wild side, New York time sign. Staying alive was no job, had second hand. Mount Bonson, old man. So then we moved to Shaolin Land, a young youth, keeping the go to. Love How it. quickly did you get into Wu Tang, Steve? It took me forever. It it wasn't immediate. Uh, it, it wasn't until after my doggy style phase and my my older friends and my older cousins they gravitated towards Wu Tang, and then I learned about it from them. And then the the Method Man, which is on this album, uh, M E T H O D, like that shit was catchy. And then he did the. Uh, the, the joint with Mary J. Blige, because he I, I thought he was the initial breakout star and I saw more of him. And then uh, ODB, I knew about him from his MTV interview. And then, oh, baby, I like it. Bro. And it wasn't until like 95, I want to say that I became an official Wu-Tang head. Yeah, it took me a while. It took to, what was the one? There was another one that came out like late in the 90s that I remember. Like, that's when I really Wu-Tang started. forever. Yeah, I think that's what it was. But I, you're right. I think Method Man was the one that jumped out because of that song, if nothing else. And he has like kind of the most personality of the, like the main dudes, I think. But uh, yeah, man, they were. I I was just like, I think there was something like whenever you grew up with like that West Coast East Coast thing, if you had any opinion of it, it like made you avoid the other sides music for a while. And I think maybe that's why it took me a while to get into like Wu Tang and other like East Coast shit. You you let the media make your decisions, man. I'm, dude, I'm a fucking puppet, but, dude. I just I'm an easy I, manipulated. You know, I'm easily manipulated. I, I will say Wu Tang. I think that they stayed away from that shit. They were pretty good at staying out of that because, despite being based out of New York, uh, Method Man is one of the few people who can say they had a song with Biggie and Tupac. Yeah, yeah, they did. They kind of. I think people were kind of forced to do that because it was such a big thing. I think they spoke out about like all that shit going on, but. Uh... Yeah, it is weird. Like I, that it was like a manipulation. You like avoided it. You're like, no, folks. It's like being a steel, you know, a Cowboys fan, and like somebody talking about the Eagles or some shit. You're just like, no, fuck that. Fuck that good point. And, fuck that good music. I can't listen to it. 
And man, I, I was more loyal to East Coast, even though I, I did listen to Snoop and Dre and Cube and all of that, man. But these guys, I don't know what my life would be without the Wu Tang Clan, man. Like they not, not only helped me like with my perspective on music, but just in life and how to approach life, man. And just I don't know. And, and maybe it, it, they have this philosophy. There, there's like a whole like mythology behind it, man. RZA has this book on on the Wu Tang. And, you know, one of these days I read it. I'm actually reading Raekwon's book from Staircase to Stage. And it's pretty dope telling about like how he came up and how he met these guys, how he knew these guys. And, you know, they lived every like hip hopper's dream uh, as far as like getting together with your boys, traveling the world, being successful, putting out great music, making that music sell and people just gravitating towards it, man. Like I've seen Wu-Tang concerts where they're in Asia and you would have thought it was in New York, man. Like the world, not just the East Coast or West Coast, the world loves Wu-Tang, man. And like, it all started with like one guy with a vision. And I don't know if you've ever seen the show, but like, it was like splitting hairs for, for some of those guys. They were like, nah, man, he's from that side of the borough. I'm not fucking with him. And it was just like, no, man, fuck all of that shit, man. I have an idea that can get y'all out of all of this shit. And thank God they all of those key members bought into it, man. Um, mm -hmm. Just iconoclastic personalities. Each one has their own vibe. Each one has their own style from Method Man to you, God. Uh, and, and people shit on you, God, because he's one of the lesser celebrated ones but one of the best verses he's done is on this album raw i'ma give it to you with no trivia with like cocaine straight from bolivia my hip-hop will shock and rock the nation like the emancipation proclamation that shit is just mm -hmm. oh whoa i love you thank you thank you <laughs> wow dude like it's like a warm blanket for steve i can't get enough of woo gotta get more woo oh. but Got a, got a show to do. Also in 93, A Tribe Called Quest releases Midnight Marauders, and this was also critically acclaimed. Uh, a lot of great music dropped on no, November 9th, 93, man. Um, this is the one with relaxation. Um, it's it, You've heard it on the Wayans Brothers intro. It's like right after they do, we're brothers, we're happy. And, we're, and then they cut to another song. And then it's like that. This it's a la electric relaxation. Huh. So did they have a lot of features on this? Because I'm seeing like the Beastie Boys on the cover and stuff. This had quite a few. I want to say. It had uh, some guys from De La Soul. It had Buster Rhymes and Large Professor. And I think for the album cover, they were just going for kind of like a Sergeant Pepper's kind of deal, but like in a modern hip hop, because there's also African Bombada back there. I see Prince Paul. I see the Beastie Boys. There's. So it's just like a kind of like a Hall of Fame or like backdrop almost. Yeah, like a, a pop cultural, like hip hop collage kind of deal. So we're on a war tour with my I'm a man. I know you've heard that one. I'd have to hear it. Dude, I suck. I'm just like not my memory for music. I'm not like a musical encyclopedia like you are. I need to be in a room and you have me like people. That's how I always learn music. Is somebody go listen to this? Because otherwise I just listen to what I listen to. Well, in 1996, Evander Holyfield upsets Mike Tyson in the 11th round knockout uh, in Las Vegas to regain the WBA heavyweight boxing title. It's the second boxer since Muhammad Ali to win a heavyweight title three times. And I, I was so sad when that happened because yeah. I, I like Evander, but Mike is my goat, man. It sucks for Evander because that guy was a brick shithouse and like a killer, but you just wanted Mike to win so bad. I, Cause I remember I was the same way. I was like, man, fuck man. But seeing like vintage Evander Holyfield is crazy. Anybody could knock that dude out. Cause he was just like a walking muscle that was just beating the shit out of people. He was that guy. It, you know, you never seen Mike get knocked out up at well, Buster Douglas, but after he came out of jail, it was like, nah, dude, this Mike, 
this is the new and improved Mike. He he's came out of jail. Mike. You know, is, the, yeah. he's even harder than he used to be. Yeah. So when he got knocked out, I was like, fuck. What? What? No. I mean, it was crazy because he was still like, he still had it. He didn't lose anything physically, but it was just his time. And this is how boxing is. That's how all sports are. It's just like a cycle. Eventually, you just, somebody's going to come around that's way better than you. And Evander was. He's bigger, reach. I mean, he's, there ain't no like muscle. He ain't like going to get out toughed. He was just a fucking hard ass dude. So, it's, I mean, shout out to that dude because people might forget because Mike Tyson's a different dude now. And if you didn't grow up with him, like, there was a time where that guy was like winning fights just by walking out to the ring and like people being scared shitless of him. Grown men. Fucking big dude. Fucking tough. Yeah, men that were older than him, pissing their pants, not even really wanting to do it. It was like, well, shit, I, this is what I do for a living. I he, and he's my opponent. I, <laughs> I and I mean, on the biggest stages too. Like, I mean, say what you will, but like getting up and like having somebody, because it was like a different time too, where there was only so many outlets. So like this guy, they were like publicizing it. Everyone knew about it. Everybody loved Mike Tyson. Everybody loved boxing because there was no other options. And uh, he was like the, he was the Michael Jordan of boxing at that point. Nike had all those crazy cool ads. Like I remember that one where he was like, his face was like metal, but it was like iron, it was an iron Mike thing that Nike did. But uh, he was just this fucking just God of boxing. And, you know, we all wanted to see that continue, but Evander was like, nah, fuck all that. (laughs) And, and and shout out to Evander, man. You're a legend too. It's just, man, we we like Mike better. But um, November 9th, nineteen ninety seven, Survivor Series ninety seven is aired on pay per view through WWF at Molson Center in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. And yes, this is the Survivor Series where Doug Furness and Phil Lafon have their last pay per view match with WWF. That's what we're all known it as. Oh my yep. God! Finally, yes, we get to man, talk I about know. this, Steve. Jesus. Yeah, man. Just kidding. It's about the Montreal screw job. And man, the, this thing has been chronicled. There's been documentaries, Dark Side of the Rings. They've actually had a full hour of those two individuals sitting down years after and calling it a truce where one party finally came clean. They've had so many. This is like the Pac and Biggie of wrestling. Um, I, I To me, this is the greatest rivalry in wrestling. Better than Austin McMahon, better than Hogan Savage, Hogan Giant, DDP Savage. Uh, who else? Uh, Austin Hart, Austin Owen Hart. This is the biggest, man, because they had the same trajectory around the same time. They had real life beef, did not like each other. And as we'll see in, in the match that they have, their personalities share it it shows like how much of a polar contrast they are yeah one's like the goody two shoes like do it by the books and Shawn michaels is just the upstart braggadocious i like him because i even because they're building this up this is like years of build up because we've been talking years. about this and they've been dueling they're both successful they're both rising and uh Shawn Michaels has this insanely great line where he's like, you do this because you love, or he like, you love it or you want to be the best. Or she's like, I do this because I like it. And he's just like, I don't give a fuck about if you don't like me talking, I'm going to talk and shit because I'm fucking the, I am the show. So whatever speech that was, these guys, the writing, it was all, you're right. I mean, I can't really even think of like, uh, any sort of just beefs in wrestling that you could even compare to this. Cause this is like, again, years of buildup, years of this like monumental success. And it is, it's pretty, uh, it is wild, man. It's great storytelling. Like these were the guys that, that kept the flag waving, even in the down times of WWF. I, I think we probably dropped out of wrestling around the same time when they were having wrestling mailmen and clowns and shit. It's like, yeah. hey, yeah, yeah, let's watch some Power Rangers. Yeah. But these guys, these were the two that were at the top of their game and like they were the main eventers, you know, 
switching off championships, whether it was Intercontinental or the World Championship. And, you know, Vince has them to thank for that, man. You know, Hogan had left, Warrior, Savage, all those guys jumped ship, went to WCW. But these were the two. The two, when when all those guys mentioned, after mentioned, when they were there, they were in a tag team. And then, you know, after the steroid scandal, Vince wanted to go smaller. You know, he was known for having the big brute guys as the face of his company. And then he took a gamble on these two gentlemen who were both in, in highly celebrated tag teams, I would say, the Rockers and the Hart Foundation. And um, kicking off, man, we're going to have Jim Ross and Jerry the King, man. Um, you know, the Attitude Era is basically here at this point. Um, and, and it's going to really be here by the end of this show. Uh, this is these were the voices that that guided us through Monday Night Raws and all of those great late ninety pay per views. Um, the first match we have is the Headbangers Mosh and Smash with the New Blackjacks, Blackjack Wyndham and Blackjack Bradshaw versus the Goodwins, Godwins, Henry O and Phineas with the New Age Outlaws, Road Dog and Billy Gunn. Yeah, as I mean, of everybody here, there's only two notables that we care about, at least that I care about. Um, and th I don't know that the New Age Outlaws have found their exact thing yet, but they're doing a great job because Road Dog comes out and is just like, hello, you maple loving freaks. <laughs> He's, I mean, the yeah. lines are just fucking killer. I think he calls the headbangers the butt bangers too, which, you know, <laughs> kind of questionable, but it's fucking hilarious. I see the steers and queers already made it to the ring. <laughs> Didn't he steal the black? Aren't they wearing the blackjacks hats right now? I think so. Around stealing people's shit. <laughs> They're degenerates, man. I love it. Um. Yeah. Ba. Badass Billy Guns getting the business. They're saying some crazy shit to him. The crowds. This is an Attitude Era crowd, so they've got some opinions. Yeah. Um. And basically, you know, these guys, the whole match starts and the New Age Outlaws, they're just kind of hanging out, Steve. You know, they're they're not really getting in the mix too much because they're too sexy. You know, these they're other too guys, cool. look at Phineas back there. This guy looks fucking half Momo'd out. He looks like a fart. And I, I'm glad that one of those fuckers gets eliminated quick. Bradshaw, he, he's a piece of work himself. Uh, JBL, if you will, <laughs> he eliminates him with, uh, I think he gave him one of those clotheslines from hell. And yeah. then uh, shortly after that, Billy Gunn gets Thrasher out of here because fuck a headbanger too. Uh, Mosh, he eventually eliminates Phineas O. So both of the Godwins are gone, thank God. Uh, Bradshaw, he gives one of the hardest Lariat clotheslines. That, that's one of the things I will give Bradshaw. Yeah. Them shits are like stiff looking. He does. Uh, he does give like some good violence, even the punches and stuff. And his buddy, the Wyndham dude, is yeah. that Barry Wyndham? Is that who that is? That's Barry Wyndham. Yeah. So that guy, you know, he does. He kind of looks like a, he has dad bod, but that dude's like a powerhouse. He's throwing people around that are gigantic. So both those dudes, I don't really, I don't like Bradshaw. I didn't even like when they get like teamed him up with Farouk. I just don't like his vibe too much. But uh, I got to say, that Wyndham dude, he was the suplex in some big fucking dudes. I was, like, pretty impressed with that. Yeah, he's an OG, man. A, a lot of people think that when he was in the Four Horsemen, like, that's their favorite version of the Four Horsemen. Um, but, yeah, Bradshaw, he gives a hard lariat, and he also gets eliminated by the D-O-double-G. <laughs> uh, and then Road Dog, he gives a blind tag to Billy Gunn, who then lands a far away boot drop? That shit did not connect. I, I saw it a couple <laughs> times. Did you see that? Like I, th I like think I clocked that he fucked up, but it wasn't. It was like the angle. I think he thought like, do they know like that kind of shit, or do they just have to just well, do their best? The angle, the the original angle didn't do it any justice because when they did the replay, they showed it from a different angle, so it didn't seem as obvious. But the fucking New Age Outlaws, they're causing shenanigans, Steve. They're all the survivors they're, and they win this match because they, they're those dudes and they're about to be those dudes. I, and we were talking about it. I don't know if they're technically affiliated with DX yet, but they're on their way. They're figuring it yeah. out. They didn't join until after Sean was out. Like, you know, Sean, he, he took a, like a mini retirement or whatever after WrestleMania 14. And so then in comes new age outlaws with X-Pac 
and they have a new reformed DX. And of course, China's still there with Triple H. But um, the, the next match is the Truth Commission, the Jackal, the Interrogator, Sniper, and Retard. I mean, Recon. And it sounds like a Tom, they all sound like Tom Clancy novels. The, the Interrogator, the Sniper, and Recon, starring Tommy Lee Jones, versus DOA, Crush, Chains, Eight Ball, and Skull. Who in the fuck are the, like, Truth Commission, Steve? This, I couldn't eat, like, how long did this last? A couple of weeks? A couple of months, maybe. Now, the, the guy in the middle, you remember, that's Kurgan from the, from the oddities. Yeah, and he was in, I mean, he's been in mad shit. That guy's like in movies and stuff. But all the, these other guys, Sniper and Recon, they're a couple of chuds. It's totally. uh, Jackal is set up to be some kind of like David Koresh. Like, uh, yeah. like I guess he's like some kind of weird fucking... My he's he's a genius, you know. He's manipulating everybody. He's a cult leader. <laughs> and after the Truth Commission, the Jackal he was like the first manager of the Acolytes, who would eventually be the APA. So he he's a footnote in the history of APA. Who you will. is is he? Somebody like in, behind the scenes of wrestling, like a Paul Heyman? That there's a reason they're giving this dude so much shine, or I, not quite. Paul Heyman, but he he's been in other promotions. I think he was involved in the ECW. Um, he might have been a writer, one of the uh, bookers or something. It's just weird. They got these yoke dudes. They got a guy that's like seven foot, and then they just got a dude that looks like uh, Stevie Richards' brother that's just out there like <laughs> to was, be out there, you know? I was just thinking that bizarro world, Stevie Richards. Yeah. And Interrogator, he eliminates chains. And th this should be called the the sidewalk slam match. Because oh I think God. everyone got eliminated by a sidewalk slam. And, you know, they're pushing the fuck out of Interrogator. I feel like they had big plans for Interrogator. Well, I feel like you get a guy that big and you just, it's like El Gigante. It's like, we got to try. Like, hopefully this guy can figure out the wrestling part, but he looks incredible. So... You know, this guy is intimidating. He is pretty, he's huge, but God damn, they like hype him up. And then all he does is get hit a bunch, do what we said, like almost lose his balance and then just be like, oh, and sidewalk slam somebody, which in any other wrestling match, that's not even a one count. But for some reason, when the interrogator does it, you're out. Doesn't matter. These bikers, they can't handle a sidewalk slam. Not from a seven footer, and eight ball he eliminates the jackal after a spinning uh, sidewalk slam. So he's he spun at least eight ball spun with his sidewalk slam, <laughs> and, and then skull he eliminates recon the reject, uh, and then skull he gets eliminated by sniper. Like, honestly, and it's hilarious because like all these guys are like interchangeable. Eight ball and chains. They they can't even tell the difference in the like the crew. They, JR's like I don't know which one they are. So yeah. fuck it's, it. It's the one of the bald head ones. And also, I you know, the crush dude. Every time this guy's in a match, it's like he's the light least stiff person in this match, and he is the stiffest fucking wrestler of all time. This guy can't wrestle out of a paper bag. Thank, thank God the interrogator gets him. And the only like real thing that I thought was kind of funny was that they, you know, the jackal gets eliminated and then he gets on the mic and starts like mixing it up with Jr. and the King and stuff. And yeah. I, I thought he was just kind of funny, but I was just like, I don't remember the jackal and I don't remember this weird, like the truth commission. What is the truth? Just what jackals rantings? Like, what is it? This, the Truth Commission is basically like, it, it comes from South Africa. There was a actual commission called the Truth and Something Commission. And oh like God. those guys were against apartheid, I believe. Um, I, I have to do the deep wiki to search that for that. I hope they're but, not referencing that. I hope they're not insulting no, something real. <laughs> they're wearing the same kind of garb, the hats and everything. So yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. And Thankfully, it didn't last long. And Kurgan, the interrogator, he sidewalk slams eight ball and gets the pin. So no more eight ball. And, and Crush suplex slams uh, the sniper. 
uh, and eliminates him. And then Interrogator, he creeps into the ring and gives Crush another sidewalk slam and gets the pin. Interrogator is the sole survivor. Also, there's something about gigantic dudes where they all have that, that Andre the Giant voice. You know, oh, like... Oh, oh. But he's... Like, this guy's famous because he's so big. He's been in movies because of that. I forgot he was in the oddities, uh, but that tracks. But even that I wasn't into. So, like, it's just one of these, like, cases where these big dudes, they can't wrestle. They're just big, you know? But they're pushing the fuck out of them for sure. But you can't coach height. And, and, and now they pull the crowd to see who they think will win the main event. And man, they, they come back to Jerry and, and JR. He's like, did you see the faces of some of the people in Canada? <laughs> I mean, they're all Bret Hart fans in Quebec, Steve. No, everybody's against Shawn Michaels and you fucks. You goddamn fucks. That's fair. And meanwhile, Kevin Kelly is in the back with Stone Cold Steve Austin. And he's like, people are worried about my neck, thinking that I, I'm not supposed to participate in any matches, any events. Uh, don't bother me right now. I'm on these AOL chats. All right, now I got somebody typing for me. All right. Age, sex, and location. Ask them. <laughs> ASL. Just type that. <laughs> it's just part of the game. Okay? <laughs> Hit me up on AIM. Uh, yeah, I love that when they have to, like, they just have to have this communication. If it wasn't an 800 number that you can call, Stone Cold's one aim chat away from, I guess, cursing you out. I don't know. He's a heavily requested man around this time. A lot of people want an AOL chat with him. I would have loved to, but like, I don't, what do you ask a Stone Cold? How's your neck, bud? (laughs) I love that that's what they're asking. They're concerned, Steve. Let's see what Smelly Cat 69's got to say. Uh Uh-uh. And now, yeah. the next match is uh, Team USA, Vader, Goldust, Mark Merrill with Sable, and Steve Blackman against Team Canadia, uh, which is Doug Furness, Phil LaFont, Jim Neidhart, and British Bulldog. Um, Steve Blackman, his spot was supposed to be the Patriot spot, but the Patriot, he injured his bicep or tore his bicep a couple weeks prior, so he steps in. And, you know, you're talking about another legit badass who can really fight and fuck somebody up. Uh, He's considered a lethal weapon, Matt. Well, and the story goes, Steve, that he was he came out of the crowd and attacked somebody, uh, you know, and was actually given the spot by Vader because I think he was defending Vader, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Um, that's a shocking image you have behind you, but. So Blackman's coming in. He's just an amateur, basically. That's what they're paying him as. They're like, this guy is getting the shot like that guy in the in the Invincible movie. He kicked the guy. He kicked some ass, and now he gets to go out there. And I just want to say, like, Team Canada, Team USA, you know, the British Bulldogs from the UK. Jim Neidhart's from Reno, Nevada, Steve. So the Team Canada, they got some ringers in here that I'm just like, these guys are turncoats of their country. I don't like this. <laughs> Doug Furness is from Oklahoma. And even Jim Ross, he even says, like, I remember Doug Furness when he played high school for blah, 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 blah. And JR and the Kings is like, hey, don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. I think, well, that- like, Doug Furness comes on and is like, all like America's making me say <laughs> they're slime, they do drugs, they blah, blah, blah. The heartbreak kids, the our fucking leader. Fuck that. I'm going to Canada, son. Um, and you know, Team USA. I was like, well, Goldust is in the mix. Marlena is gonna be there. Nah, we get robbed of that beauty because I think Goldust is in the midst of some kind of dramatic shit going on <laughs> domestically. It, it, I, yeah, I don't and know. that's that's what the fu is for. Freedom Unchained because just recently he left his family. You know, there there was a, a, a little vignette where, you know, he he calls for divorce, Marlena. He's leaving his son behind and he's just done. He, he wants nothing to do with him. And I, I I gotta say, this is not a good representation for Team America. This guy that just left his family, he's a cowardly dad. And then Vader, he was really a heel here in America at the time. I don't remember when he became face. Uh, and then Mark Merrill, the prize fighter, the wife beater. And then hey, Steve Blackman. 
I'm not going to say anything bad. Uh, Steve, Steve, Blackman, Steve Blackman. I mean, he's painted as a, just a lethal badass. And I, I do, you know, but again, he's like this Ken Shamrock thing where he's got one thing. And even Mark Merrow at this point, he's just doing fucking his Muhammad Ali impersonation in the ring. <laughs> it's like, dude, they would have just called Virgil back if that's all you're going to do. Yeah, I mean, please, that man definitely give Virgil the spot. Mark Merrill's out here punching fucking Sable in the face. She's out here wearing like Ray Charles glasses, not even looking sexy, Steve. Oh, she can't even say sexy, anything. Man. You can't even say anything to the woman, or Mark's gonna come over there and take her away, move her to another side of the ring, Steve. Yeah, he feels threatened by the gold dust drip, and you know. British Bulldog, I find this funny when he's taunting black men. <laughs> like he he got a little offensive. He got he got a little move, and then he's like, "Yeah, <laughs> I know you hate." I, British actually, Bulldog. I gotta give it to British Bulldog. I was like, I like this. I like this like cocky, shitty British Bulldog. I like this. Um, yeah, but Team, you know, USA. I don't know if this was the Olympics. This ain't the dream team, Steve. You know, I love but yeah. even Vader. It's like. He tries to be American and nationalistic, but it's just funny. It's like, (laughs) what the fuck? Not with that promo, pal. Because all of the promos throughout this Survivor Series sucked. Even even the we'll get to the LOD one. Like, and yeah, I'm sorry, Hawk. I love you too, but like, man, were you drunk? Anyways, (laughs) well, I I had a couple of too many at Applebee's today, bud. Oh, uh, you're right, because they, but like they're like they don't even set them up good because they're like Vader's gonna introduce the Team USA to the world, and he's like, "This my man, Mark Merrow. He's over here. That gold dust is freaky ass back in the back. He's cool, and Blackman, <laughs> yeah. you know, he's cool too. This guy's lethal as hell, but you know me, you know me, so yeah. we like, don't like big mouth Canadians telling us what to do." Ooh. That's it's cheap heat. Just say something bad about the the town or the country, and just like ah. I mean, to get Rick Rude in there to give you some lines or something. I mean, even fucking Road Dog called him maple loving freaks. Do something. Put some pizzazz into it. You know. Everybody can't be Jesse James though, and Blackman, being the the rookie that he is, he he lights up all of Team Canada, giving them karate chops and roundhouse sweeps, and he's counted out. <laughs> they didn't they didn't tell like, him about the rules he's like and the jr's like this man's just a street fighter he didn't even understand the rules like come on dude come yeah, on shamrock could he shamrock didn't get you hit man like yeah it's 10 seconds and you're out uh and then vader he hits a couple big body splashes on the anvil he gets the pin so no more night heart i kind of want to see some more of the anvil man that's my guy uh, Vader, he manhandles Phil LaFont, hits a Vader splash off the second rope, and Phil LaFont bids you adieu. <laughs> yeah, and then, uh, you know, Mark Merrill gets, they give him a shot, Steve. Because there's really only three people wrestling for Team USA. Goldust the whole time just kind of like looking around. He looks like kind of interested for a while, then he'll look away. Uh, fucking... Mark Merrill, he gets in, he does his little boxing thing a bunch. And then really, you know, he has to pull Sable away from some rowdy Montre- Montrealans or whatever you call these people, some Quebecois. And, uh, but it's Mark Merrill, Steve, the madman, the wild man, whoever, whatever he is at this point. I'm just not digging it. And he's just basically yeah. is painted as a wife beater. They're, they're like that's his that's his gig now. He's just a guy who's just like a little overbearing on his wife, his very hot exactly. wife. I think I would prefer him as Johnny B. Good more, like because this marvelous Mark. Yeah, at least he had some something. It was a something like this is just a do rag and some boxer trunks. Can and you he's imagine just, oh, if he was still being that? <laughs> <laughs> fucking the that one if he was johnny b bad or whatever now in the attitude era that would have been fantastic they could have played off perfect. that well it's better than the wife beater mark marrow him and Goldust would have worked perfectly together man <laughs> and you know it, speaking of mark marrow he's get those jabs and i will say this he does this pretty dope backflip that got fumbled and it wasn't his fault it was the guy that he's supposed to like drop onto um he, like he stands 
on the turnbuckle. He turns around and then does a backflip, like standing up. Impressive. I'll give you that, Mark Merrill. Marvelous. Yeah, <clears throat> but again, he fucked it up. So, I mean, yeah, that's it. He, yeah. he did bounce off the ropes pretty cool. Uh, didn't pay off. Uh, but he eventually gets his, Steve. He gets he gets thrown out, and then he's just got to drag Sable out. He's got That's really basically what he's waiting for. He's like, we got to get you out of here before somebody oogles your tits. And I yeah. see it. He's crazy Quebecois. And, uh, you know, now it, it's Goldust and Vader represent Team USA, and Goldust wants no part. Apparently he broke his hand uh, on, on top of being a deadbeat dad, absentee father, uh, and recently divorcee from Marlena. So when it comes to responsibility in this day and age, this gold dust right here wants no parts. And if that means tagging into a Survivor Series match, play like, on oh, no, I'm freedom unchained. Leave me alone. I mean, Vader's out there fucking breathing like he's goddamn about to have a coronary. All he wants is a tag. He needs a break, Steve. This man's almost 500 pounds. And gold dust eventually does get a tag reluctantly he gets it i think he actually instead it's not really a tag he gets slapped in the face he slaps the fuck out of him as he <laughs> should like, and Goldust get... comes in and he's like they're like well what's gonna happen now he's gotta fight now and he's like you know what and i'm just still not feeling great because i fucking left marlena and that was a big mistake so i'm just gonna go to the back yeah just just gonna roll out the ring and just count me out like y'all did steve blackman and so Vader's riding solo against British Bulldog and Doug Furnace. Uh, Vader, he hits the Vader bomb and eliminates Furnace. But British Bulldog comes in and clocks Vader with the ring bell as the ref's back is turned. And, and he's able to get the bell out of the ring, get the pin. British Bulldog, sole survivor, just like Destiny's Child. <laughs> he's a survivor. He is, Steve. And I mean... This is a kind of a, a dirty British bulldog that I don't remember. He's kind of get he's doing all the funky shit. Clock Vader with a bell. He's doing it all in the name of Canada. So respect. I guess he is part of the Canadian dream team. By marriage. <laughs> and uh, Jacqueline Cook, she calls in. They, they're having this call in for a uh, Survivor Series supper sweepstakes. And Jacqueline Cook from Columbia, South Carolina. It, she sounds like she's getting cooked right now on the phone. Oh my phone. god! Oh, oh my god! god. Oh, oh, oh my god! Oh, oh my god! So who do you want to have a supper with? Oh, Stone Cold Steve Austin. Oh, oh, oh. Fucking the king's like, wait, not me, not me. Uh, yeah, Jacqueline, she she's amped up for sure i mean it might be adrenaline it might be mess but she's can barely get out dick. stone cold <laughs> sounds like she's getting pound pounded <laughs> god oh damn god. it oh my god oh, stone cold for the super comer for the super summer sweet survivor uh. <laughs> king really wants to go out to dinner with this chicken you know rightfully so Good. She's willing to fuck on the phone uh, during a pay-per-view, but they're going to call her back so they can arrange a dinner with her and Stone Cold. You think Stone Cold's getting anywhere near that trash, Steve? I'm too busy with these AOL chats. <laughs> Age, sex, location, bitch. Um, and the next match, Steve, and this is a good one. Uh, Kane... He's it a is. thing now. He's he's coming up. He's on the way up. He's destroying the WWE. And he's going up against Mankind, who's feeling a little bit fucking insulted because Paul Bear just, he's turned his back on Mankind, who's given his life to this man. Uh, well, Matt, these hoes ain't loyal, and neither is Paul Bear, because he turned his back on Undertaker after managing him for years. He joined Mankind. Turned his back on Mankind. To join up with Kane, and here we are, calling him a pebble. I'm not a fucking pebble. Fucking goddamn, he can act. Everyone, when he wants to, he can throw a psycho yell at you that really gets your attention. It's, it's probably my favorite version of Mick Foley. And this is, I mean, dude, I I never really liked Kane. I because you know I was like, you just fucking a wannabe Undertaker. But looking yes. at it now, it is kind of crazy that they got a guy who's like of similar size to the dude and is basically like great at mimicking 
the way Undertaker moves and like his moves, he's kind of imitating that guy in this character of Kane. Like he has a lot of the same moves and shit. It's pretty fucking cool. Like the storyline that they set up. I like it. it. And that's what takes it away from me. Cause it's like your whole being, your whole character yeah. is based off a whole nother. Like you need another character for your thing to be in existence. And throughout, even when he's not around, you're ba- you're like attached to that. That's that's the one take that kind of keeps me away from Mike and Kane. But I don't. You think um, it's kind of cool though that he, on top of just having to do wrestling, and which is hard enough, he has to. Fi- he had to like, because I'm assuming he wasn't like doing that himself. Like this guy wasn't making undertaker moves his whole career like that's something he had to add into his repertoire to do this and that's pretty fucking cool i think i mean i didn't like the character because i liked undertaker i grew up with him and i was like fuck this guy but right you know he's his brother steve he's his little baby bro yeah i mean (laughs) but he's got to he's got to tackle mankind and uh that's not an easy task because you can throw this motherfucker through everything and he's just going to keep coming. And that's what basically happens in this match, Steve. Yes. It's just yeah. a mankind punishment match. My God, stop the carnage. Oh my God. I mean, he gets choked slammed multiple times like on the fucking ramp, which is just made of metal. He goes through the, the Spanish announce table and almost fucking cripples Tito Santana, for God's sakes. The ledge. Poor Tito. Um, <laughs> But he does, I love that he's like, like basically Mankind's mission is not just to like kind of beat up Kane. He wants to really get those fingers down Paul Bear's throat because he called him a pebble, Steve. And he doesn't like that. Yeah. He wants to get those hands down those trembling flappy jaws. <laughs> kind of went to Terry Funk a little bit. <laughs> um, But, you know. He does, Mankind does it. He with overcomes Kane. He knocks him out a couple of times and does get, he gets to throw those fingers down Paul Bear's throat, which is disgusting. I don't want to see that. I don't want to think about yeah. that. But um, hilarious at the same time. And um, he just won't give up. But he's thrown off the ring. He's thrown out of the ring. He's thrown on the ground. And eventually he gets choke slammed. And I think he gets a tombstone too. And that's that um mankind you can beat him up but he's gonna come back he's gonna keep ticking steve in one version or another or another um yeah bang bang and this is actually kane's first pay-per-view match i mean they're setting him up but he's on that goldberg run where he's just like basically annihilating everybody he's beating up everybody uh he's just he's not gonna stop until he gets the undertaker and i think it's basically the undertaker's like i'm not gonna touch my family and you see, that's another killer. reason. <laughs> when Kane came around, this he like he represents the low end of Taker. This is like you're, you're bringing out the worst in Taker because this makes him look pussified, like he's got a heart, like he's got a conscience. When he first came out, he didn't give a fuck. He scared your kids. He scared your wife. I, I'll come from the dead, come out of the casket. Now he's got a conscience. Like I won't fight family. No, dude, you supposed to not give a fuck about if kill your brother, kill your daddy. You supposed to. Let me just put him in the coffin. Yeah. You ain't the big taker. brother taker. You're the undertaker, you piece of shit. And I, but I, that's why I didn't like Kane. You know, they did all this shit. They do, and even like half of this match, like they keep, the, I don't know if it was a mistake, but they keep his red lighting throughout it, which so they even have to make. He's like, Kane has the power. He's, he's so powerful. He's affecting the lighting. It's like, okay. I get it. This guy's big as fuck. And he is a brick shit house. It is like, he's impressive to watch, but I mean, Mick, you're going up against Mick Foley, dude. Like, you're stiff. And he's willing to throw his body. He's a bit willing to kill himself. So he's willing to die in that ring. And uh, now we have a backstage interview with the man, Vince. And, you know, Sword and Slaughter speaks out first. He's like, we got extra security backstage and this, that. And uh, Kevin Kelly, or I don't know who it was. What was it? Kevin Kelly, maybe he asked Vince. So, who do you think is going to win? Oh, I don't know. Oh, Vince. Oh, oh, Vince. You evil genius. Bret Hart watched that after the match. Was like, you son of a bitch. 
But, oh my goodness. I mean, what what's the extra security? The the Canadian mounted police are out, like just in case these Canadians try to storm the building if Shawn Michaels wins. Uh well they they know that that's not going to happen. Oh, they well, they know that's going to happen. So like they're trying to get security for themselves, probably. <laughs> All right. We gotta get out of here, man. Let's kill yeah. him, eh? Get him, eh? <laughs> But speaking of stiff, Steve, the next match involves one of our favorites. Oh, God. (laughs) Ahmed Johnson, dude. It's it's a couple stiffs because, like, as much as I love LOD, they're the GOAT tag team. They had a reputation for being pretty stiff. And, you know, Shamrock, he's fresh off the porch in this wrestling game. So he was pretty stiff. So, like, this is just a team of stiffs with Doc Hendricks, Michael P.S. Hayes. (laughs) Well, I had some Canadian bacon today, Hawk. What? I mean, it's like shit show of a fucking interview. And look at Ahmed. They don't even let him come behind Doc. He's just back there hidden the whole time behind Doc's weird blonde mullet that he's got. At this point, they know better than to put the mic in front of that man. And like, I usually look forward to the Hawk's part. What's he going to say? Because they're usually pretty entertaining, pretty witty. This time around, it's like a deer in headlights. Like, nobody knows what to say. It just seems like everybody, whenever they speak in these backstage promos, they just, like, caught off guard. Like, <laughs> yeah, like, well, somebody's uh, like, hey, dude, what do you want to say? <laughs> like, are we, what? <laughs> well, uh, we are the, uh, the, the defensive arms, and you better make sure you have a real friend, because you could be in a pool of blood or not. Uh, right on, rush. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All yeah. right, back to you guys. Um, but so those four dudes, they're gonna go up against the nation of domination, uh, which at this point is the Rock, Farouk, Kama Mustafa, the Godfather, and D'Lo Brown, the man. D'Lo does his thing in this too. I gotta say, D'Lo is making me laugh at this shit. <laughs> I, hey man, people sleep on D'Lo, and at some point, Nation of Domination must be like in the Hall of Fame. Man, you got DX, you got NWO. I feel like Nation of Domination might have been like the third, or at least my third favorite of the stables. I mean, they, with with the right roster, when they were going up against like DX, that's yes. Yeah, the Rock that, was that like kind of the man, but the Farouk was still in there and shit. Hell yeah, dude. And also, they just like they got a roster, dude. I mean, the Rock wasn't even himself, but like, dude, Godfather. I forgot how kind of like big that motherfucker was, and he's karate kicking people and shit. <laughs> hell yeah, dude. I mean, they're one of the greatest cliques of our generation just because they came up at the right time, you know, and they had a real cool vibe. It's like a fuck you vibe. The, I love that. The theme song, like the the actual like revolutionary like spirit. It, it was like a Black Pantherish kind of deal. And when they were um, walking and then, out, like, dude, everybody's just like grilling the fucking crowd. Rock's like, shut the fuck up. You know, being him, like the evil rock. I love that shit. Starting to come into his own, man. And, and this is before Mark Henry. Like that might be my favorite. Like Farouk, Farouk was out, and then like they kind of replaced him with Mark Henry. Um, but yeah, man, we're we're in the match and you know, Hawk is, he's on the offensive. He throws comma, uh, or no, he throws the rock into the, the rope and he gets kneed in the back. And so now that he's thrown off, the rock goes in for the rock bottom and, and we, we lose Hawk. He's the first casualty of this match. Well, I gotta go to the back. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And, uh, which this allows fucking goddamn Ahmed Johnson to come into a goddamn match. And, if he wasn't stiff enough, he's got leg braces on every part of his leg. Uh, luckily, uh, Steve, this might be the first match his ass doesn't come out, thankfully. They, they found some briefs that could fit. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, they let him, They t- he gets that Pearl River plunge on somebody. I don't remember. On Farouk. Who it was. was it on Farouk? Farouk tried to do his, fin- his finisher. He reverses it and throws the Pearl River plunge on him. Um, and then after that, D'Lo comes in, and I said this before, he hits a crispy frog splash yeah, on dude. Ahmed, man. That he shit. doesn't give a fuck either, because he goes, like, full extension on the shit, too. I love that. Perfection. 
Eddie would and be he's proud. He's willing to like. I like when people yell at the crowd and like kind of like talk in the ring and shit. And he does that a lot in this, and it's funny as shit. Especially the Rock. They're calling him an F word. They're they're saying yeah. Rocky die, as you'll see behind me. Yeah. And Rocky uh, sucks is is being said a bunch, uh, dude. And at one point, just because I love it, evil moves. The Rock and D'Lo perform one of the most heinous like groin shots where they like basically D'Lo pulls the dude's legs and Rock just like belts the haymakers, the guy's nuts. Uh, I think that might have been Ahmed Johnson, actually, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe it might have been because they had real heat for that dude. All of them. <laughs> That's hilarious, dude. It was like, man, fuck you. Uh, <clears throat> and eventually... Uh, you know, we get to a point, I think Animal is one of the last guys, uh, but at some point near the end of this match, Steve, our boys, the Road Dog Jesse James and Badass Billy Gunn have to come out. They got to show out again because not only have they stolen people's gear, they've stolen LOD's gear and Showed Badass <laughs> comes out with the fucking shit and the face paint, Steve. Yeah. Oh my God. And, and uh, yeah, that distracts Animal. And I, I want to say he gets counted out. Um, and yeah. for, or Ahmed. They throw, like, Ahmed. cocaine in his face. Remember? They throw, like, a bunch of yeah. powder, whatever the powder was. I, they had a big-ass bag of powder near ringside. So whatever that was, he gets a, a load of that to the grill. And he just sits out. He gets counted out because he's sitting there like, God damn it. That was for me and Hawk backstage. That wasn't for this. They got in our stash. And uh, Ahmed, he was actually eliminated at this point uh, because Farouk didn't go away immediately. After he got eliminated by Ahmed, he's by ringside and he grabs on his legs so that Rocky could pin him. And now Ahmed's out. Um, and so now we got D'Lo and The Rock against Ken Shamrock. And, you know, D'Lo gets in the, he gets the ankle lock from Ken Shamrock and he can't handle it, man. And I, I don't even remember him being the legal man. I could have swore he tagged in rock, but at this point, tags that they, they try to keep track of, but they, at some point they, I think you, they do lose track, but I do want to give D'Lo one more piece of credit because it was just cool looking. He did this like standing leg drop on a dude and just made it the pin and i was like that's baller just like to be yeah. cocky as fuck and just hold your leg there yeah but he this ankle lock at this point's like the goddamn sharpshooter as soon as he comes in you're just screaming in agony and he's out they handle it man and the rock sneaks in and hits a chair shot to the back of shamrock um and one of the rocks like staple moves that tornado ddt i always thought he did that shit the crispiest it's like that tornado where he, he whips around you and it hits you with the boom it's all oh, yeah. like a fluid motion i love that shit and he and he does that the shamrock and he also like shows the people's elbow it's not quite epic it's it's not the most electrifying move just yet but he's doing it at this point he's taking off the elbow pad and he's not doing that yet either I don't think he's just going back and forth and then the you slow mo get it. like fall like bam move though he got that little crispy on top of it. so you're we got all that we got the rock bottom and shit i was very pleasantly surprised about that the attitude flavor it's simmering it's it's whiffed it's, there. it's there man but um, yeah they, who wins this though uh, Shamrock snaps again, and, yeah. and he throws that ankle lock on the rock. And, you know, like you said, it's a sharpshooter, damn near. And Shamrock I, is the sole again, survivor. We talked about it, though, because I don't like this. I like a guy, you know, when when Warrior pumped up, you know, and shit. And, like, got, he got the crowd into it, or Hogan did that. Fucking Shamrock mm -hmm. just goes, he loses his mind has this little freak out and that's when you know the, it, he's going to go into it but it just like seems cheesy to me i gotta say i i'm sorry ken if you're listening i love you but don't put me in an ankle lock but it just, just doesn't do weird. it for you yeah i just i'm not into it uh but you know thankfully team lod it's it's the team lod was on so i got I, I had to root for it steve even if i like the nation you got i, I want hawk and animal to succeed you know they're kind of part always of the looking at the bigger picture yeah. and you know they, they promote this dx pay-per-view 
uh, for In Your House the following month in December. Uh, that'll be December the 7th. And then we also get this Stone Cold and Owen Hart vignette. You, you get the follow-up and the backstory um, of what's going on between them. And I think this is going to be his first match, if I'm not mistaken, since he got his neck fucked up from the SummerSlam of that year. It's just part of the game, Steve. It just happens. But yeah, I mean, and Owen's like, that's now his thing. Not, fuck the Slammies, fuck all the championships, the magazine covers. Now he's, it's Owen 316, I just broke your neck, Owen. He does, that's his thing, you know? Vince didn't capitalize off that. I don't know if he could. Maybe that was an Owen thing only. Maybe he just had the rights, but like, yeah. I like even as an Austin fan, like that's petty and and witty, man. Shout out to Owen, but um, oh yeah, dude, Austin comes out, man, and now Matt, they like him, they love him. You know, before I think in SummerSlam he was it was a lukewarm reaction before he got his neck broke, but after several promos over the months and weeks of Raw and all of that, man, he just building up more heat, even in Canada. He's going up against a Canadian, and they're still cheering for the man. I mean, he's out there. He's even on AIM, numerous AIM chats, just getting the, the brand out there. So, yeah. And, I mean, you couldn't help it, Steve. I didn't – I remember, like, when he first came out being like, I don't want to root for some redneck fucking dude. Fuck this dude. But you couldn't help it. He's out there whooping ass, attacking Brian Pillman in his house to the point the guy has to pull a gun out. I mean, you can't not like, it's hilarious. It's amazing. He represented the everyday man. Like, you know, like everybody wants to go to work, come home with six pack, you know, and maybe go into work with a six pack shit and beat your boss's ass from time to time. Um, but this match wasn't even that long. Owen comes out with Team Canadia. All the guys that performed in the previous match, the Furnace, LaFon, and Bulldog, and Nightheart, and some of them catch a stunner. Nightheart gets a stunner first, and he ain't even in the match. That's just how stunner rolls, how Stone Cold rolls. And the stunner rolls. But he, I mean, come on, man. Leave Jim out of it. The guy's half in the bag already. He's, just, he's already wrestled. You, you don't even know. But I do like Owen has to have his boys come out just to hold like the slammies and shit. <laughs> like, come on now, man. And basically his whole thing is like, he doesn't, he's almost pulling a gold dust here where he doesn't want to, he can get DQ'd and he doesn't lose his championship or anything. So he's like, yeah, man, like, I don't want to fucking wrestle this psycho. <laughs> you know, yeah, he's trying not, know. he's trying to get DQ'd the whole fucking match. He don't want no parts and I can't blame him, man. This is Stone Cold in 97 and you know, Austin, he's like, nah, man, come get this ass whipping. So he chases him down the aisle, brings him back in, and they do some fumbling around. They were about to do that move that they did in SummerSlam where, you know, he does the power driver and Owen tries to reverse it. But this time, Austin blocks it and, you know, flicks him off, gives him the stunner, gets the pin cleanly this time, not half fucking in a coma. And, you know, all is well with the world. Austin 316, damn it taking that strap back to the u.s steve because these canadians don't know how to act damn right son and this up next man this is this is it this is the match that's been heavily documented in so many different ways i mean explain that once we get through this i want you to give us the background on exactly why this is called the montreal screw job like Let's talk about the match first, and then you're going to give us the background on, like, the whole, like, behind-the-scenes shit. Because I'm still, like, there's been a bunch of shenanigans with Bret Hart that they even show in the lead-up to this where, you know, he'd already spit in fucking McMahon's face. He'd already done that shit where, uh, where Michaels was, like, the ref in the match I think he had with, like, Undertaker, I think. Yeah. And there's all that, like, they're, the build-up to it. And he has already been screwed over. So this is like, I guess, the ultimate like betrayal of Bret Hart. Yeah. Well, well, the spit in the face happens tonight in the, on this match, but like he had already had like a tussling with Vince. I, I think you're talking about where he like he like takes his suit jacket off. They're in the middle of the ring, and he's like fucking around with Vince. Like, ah. Yeah, I think, like but I think him. he spit on him too. Maybe I'm wrong about it. He definitely spit in fucking Shawn. Mike. Maybe it was Shawn Michaels. He spit in his face. He did okay. as a ref. 
he did spit in his fucking face. That that he did. That he did. Bret Hart, um, a man, not not shy on spinning in somebody's face, but he is the hitman, so I guess you know he can back it up. Yeah, and he's right on target, man. He's excellent execution. <laughs> but uh, man, I, I want to say right now, this Shawn Michaels introduction is one of the most gangsterish of all like comeouts of any wrestling match. Like, man, it's on par with a lot of Stone Cold come like when he comes out in the entrance and all that shit, dude. As far as getting heat, instant heat from a whole crowd, the man grabbed. He, I don't think this was even a prop that he had. He took somebody's Canadian flag on his way to the ring. L- let me back up. First off, he comes out in the dressing room with Rick Rude, China, and Triple H. They like that's a gangster ass lineup. Oh my! Right and it's a fucking like, like Eddie Murphy like, walk out to the arena where we're just following him. And Shawn Michaels at this point is like, man, I don't even know where to go. He's like so blasé about. It. I'd like be like freaking out. Not the heartbreak kid, Steve. God, look at Rick Rude though. Look at the boss, dude. Bro, this shit look. It's so gangster. Everything oh. about it, like they they get him out of the dressing room like Goldberg, and he and he walks out with the click with the crew. We, we out here and, you know, so I guess one of the stipulations is your crew cannot come out here. Brett's crew can't come out here. And Vince, I'm sure he has his own personal reasons for that. But so Sean comes out, man, he takes somebody's Canadian flag. He gets doused with Molson's on the way, unfazed. He's smiling through it all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so he takes that Canadian flag, wipes his ass and taint with it, uh, does his pose. It's with he tells, tells the, the flag, flag on the ground, Steve. Also, I mean that's that, that ain't great. Tells it, it to is, suck but... it. Oh, and then he, he fornicates with the flag. That's great. He fucks the flag. He he poses in front of the flag with pyrotechnics. He wipes his taint and ass with it, like you said. I mean, for a good thirty seconds. And I I think. You're mistaken. He stole it from a fan. I think that was a Canadian flag they put at ringside, maybe in Brett for respect to Brett, or because they were in Canada okay. for the main event. But uh, Shawn Michaels didn't give a fuck about that. He Either said, way. "Fuck that flag." Yeah, because I didn't see it when he first came out. I just like halfway through when he got to the ring, like it just appeared, and I just thought he took it from a fan, but. <sighs> Either the way, balls, that shit was dude. cheap. The balls. I mean, I, I don't think Canada yeah. is like known for its violence, but I think there's a lot of crazy people out there that if you disrespect something like a flag, they get fucking pissed off. So all those Molsons and shit, I bet that doubled. But I love that he was even like looking at fans like to their face after he did that. Just like yeah. sitting there like, fuck you, bitch. Like right to their face, yeah. dude. I love that shit. <laughs> Y'all know who I am, bitch? I'm HBK in this motherfucker. Fuck y'all country. It's hilarious. I mean, he Bill Bird, Phil, it was like Bill Burr's ran on Philly, but just with him with the yes. Canadian flag, dude. I mean, I want to, oh, like, yes. that's got to be one of the most different, like, any sport. That's one of the craziest things I've ever seen. I want to rewatch that shit tonight. I loved it, man. And I love you Canadians. You're all cool. But like we're talking in the realm of of wrestling in in this kayfabe world when you're trying to get heat and he did it magnificently. This is it, Steve. And, you know, Brett comes out. He gives his shades to the kids, but he ain't happy. And I just have to say that when you see what Shawn Michaels did, the amount of fighting that they did in the actual crowd, because they go into the crowd multiple times. If I was Shawn Michaels, I'd be like, yo, we can't do that. I, some of these motherfuckers might stick my ass with a broken Molson bottle or some shit. <laughs> like, fuck that. And some of them were getting some hits in because you saw the refs jumping in like, dude, no, yeah. no. <laughs> yeah, dude. But the match, dude, is crazy. These guys, there's a reason they yeah. were superstars. Uh Shawn Michaels not only can dish out great looking punishment, but his, and Bret Hart too, I mean, both of them, but like they make shit look like it hurts like a bitch. You know, even the shit that they flub, there's some bad like moves and stuff, but man, these guys definitely can fucking work a fucking crowd. And I just, this makes me realize, like cements that Shawn Michaels to me, the vibe, and his moveset and stuff, he is my favorite wrestler for sure. 
and this kind of cements it because he's got the attitude of this Shawn Michaels. I mean, I forgot he was this blatantly. This is like a disrespect on the <laughs> of a different level. It's hilarious. And like I said, I've always been Team Brett, but man, you can't deny the the awesome heel moves that he's making in this match, man. Like, I forgot the part that he, like, picks his nose with the Canadian flag after rubbing his ass and taint with it. Like, and just, I, Shawn Michaels always got his praise for his entering work, and I think Brett has too, but I don't think he's gotten his praise as far as, like, making the his opponents look good. Shawn Michaels didn't need that kind of help, but Bret Hart was really good at making average and subpar performers look feasible. Yeah. Because he's worked with some bums <laughs> that, didn't, yeah, that but, didn't know a wrist lock from their asshole. And he he saw, he's the same. I mean, these guys are just like, they're the same type of rest. They're just like technically they, great. They're great selling it. They're great dishing it. They have great moves. And they, they have like these key moves that they both do. I, like, I always see Bret Hart do like that backbreaker that he does, like sort of near the end. He always does, it's like, it looks insane. And he's done it a million times, but it's just like every time it's just on point. His punches, and the same with Shawn Michaels, dude. And this whole match is just like a back and forth. And I mean, like the selling of the the beef that they have also, you know, with the disrespect and like, uh, that happening pre-match and then like the first 10 minutes of the match is them beating the shit out of each other and they're like the bell hasn't even rung yet I mean Vince has to come yeah. out and be like get it in the ring please we have to ring yeah. the bell so like this whole match is just golden it's hilarious and I like to think Vince is also out there for insurance purposes because he doesn't <laughs> want that belt leaving out of his possession man and like you know, like the same thing I said about Brett. Yeah, you can say that about Sean because he's made bums look feasible on television too. Um, guys that didn't know any wrestling moves. They were just brutes. And being the guy that can sell moves like Sean, um, he he took this page from the Ric Flair book. I, I love when he gets thrown into the ring, to the turnbuckle, when he does that flip around. That takes a certain level of athleticism, man. That and just, the comic he does it with ease. Of like the fake where you like fake, uh, where you do that and then you fall down like yeah. you just passed out and stuff like Ric Flair does. He has like that too, where it's like, not, it's not like a realistic thing. It's just like makes the match. Or when yeah. he would like sell out and run and like, take a turnbuckle to the, like he'd flip over it and not like, it just looked like he completely demolished his body. Like he got fucked up. Yeah. yeah man, like there's, there's an art to that man. And both of these guys got it down like that. There's so many reasons why this is the greatest beef, man. It's just like the perfect storm. Like, and they do. I mean, the hatred's there. And I do love like near the end, like, you know, Brett's thing is always like to get a sharpshooter on eventually like sean's like no fuck that he puts a sharpshooter on brett which i love that was fucking dope as shit well before sean does the sharpshooter uh brett he jumps from the second rope to do you know his his elbow thing and then Vin sean throws him throws earl ebner into the way so like that distracts brett he like now sean is on the offensive now brett's on the floor at this point earl ebner's come to and he's putting that sharpshooter on and I thought it was longer, but like now that I'm watching it again, first time in a while, like Earl Ebner wastes no time, and oh, he just rings right. the bell. He does win off the sharpshooter. I thought it yeah. like continued past that, but you're right. It's almost like everyone's like, "Wait, what happened? Did he give up?" You know. Yeah. Earl had Vince. He had a he had an earpiece, and Steve Vince like, God, he gave up. Earl, call it. No, Vince was right there. Like they didn't need an earpiece. Like, I, and I think that's why Vince, Vince wanted to make sure that that belt does not stay with Bret Hart before the end of the night, man. And like, I, I wish I was watching wrestling at this point. Um, and like all of this stuff happened before I came back into the game. Um, you know when Austin was going into WrestleMania 14. But like, looking back on this, man, I, I've read. Bret Hart's book. I've seen all of the different takes on this, the interviews. Um, I even watched the sit down that him and Sean had years later on the network. And I get both sides. Like, I understand that Brett hated Sean because Sean was a dick, you know, like despite him being super talented and being an entertaining guy, 
he was a, he like a lot of people share that sentiment about Sean and the click around the locker room. Like these guys like controlled the booking. They ran the show. They were in Vince's back pocket in his ear and probably up his ass. But like Brett's thing was like, look, man, if this is going to be my final match in WWF and I'm going to give away the strap, I will. Lo- I don't mind losing it, but I will not lose it to this piece of shit. That's how we looked at Sean at the time. And Vince, he was under the understanding, like, look, man, I know that what happened before with my women's championship belt, we had this girl named Alundra Blaze. She was the women's champ. And then she jumped ship and went to WCW. And in her debut, she shows up with my women's championship and throws it into the into the trash can with Eric Bischoff just sitting there chuckling and he, he and Kiki in. Now, to prevent that from happening to my Eagle belt, the one that Hogan wore, the one that Warrior and uh, Sean and all the all the guy, the top guys, Randy, all those guys. No, to prevent that from being a possibility, we gonna we gonna do some shit to make sure that belt is off of you before the end of your contract. And as a business, from a business perspective, I I get that. I I hate that it went down that way. I because I get both sides because. Brett never got that rematch after the Iron Man match in WrestleMania 12. He felt like Sean was like shit being shifty. Like when it was time in WrestleMania 13, oh, I I lost my smile and all of this, that, and the third. Oh, I'm taking some time off. And then there were some other things that came out, man. Like uh, he had beef with Sonny. Like when Sonny, uh, Sonny was actually fucking Shawn Michaels. And Shawn Michaels, he tried to add Brett Harden to the mix saying, oh, Brett's had some sunny days. And Brett, that really pissed him off because he was a married man and his wife questioned him about that. And he's like, dude, I didn't, I never had sex with her, eh? And so, like, there were so many reasons to have heat for this man. And this is, like, my last day. I've been loyal to this company for over a decade, since the early 80s. This is how I'm going to end this? No, anybody but him. Bring, put Kane back into the Isaac Yankum Dennis costume i'll lose to that <laughs> motherfucker before i lose to this piece of shit who told me to get out of the ring when i when he beat me in the iron man match this is my moment get the fuck out of my ring i am not losing to that man so i get why brett feels the way he does but vince has to protect the brand that's a strong that's somebody to play i mean it's crazy how much like uh impact that he had behind the scenes like Shawn Michaels because you think like bad blood aside how much money did fucking Vince make off Brett in his family and shit you know like I get it from both sides but unfortunately for Brett I'm a Shawn Michaels fan so love the brand love the disrespect love the heartbreak kid and I'm about to love WWE again as soon as DX goes full effect which judging from that promo and that pay-per-view is about to pop it's about to happen, Steve. We're about to t- start tuning in again. Are you ready? Doom. God. But man, uh, aside from this match, really, the event itself was a stinker, in my opinion. It's so. A... It was just like weird team ups. You know, it was like they didn't even think it out. Like the Team USA thing was weird. Fucking and just having fucking like uh, DOA and stuff. It just sucks because it's just a bunch of stiff ass wrestlers. And we got there was a couple like shining moments. I feel like the mankind match that was pretty decent, that, even if you don't like that. Me. Uh, and you know, I love the shenanigans of the new age outlaws, so seeing them sort of early stages before even you know, Road Dog got the braids and shit, love that. Uh, but you know, I'm we didn't get any Marlena, which sucks. Uh, we didn't get a, a you know righteous sable like we got her looking like Ray Charles. So I'm with you. It was kind of a snoozer, but knowing the history and getting the end. I mean the the match with Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels, even with all the the politics aside, it's still a banger of a fucking match. You know, it, it, like they were able to still perform. That shows the professionalism of both of them. I think you know the same way Bret felt about Shawn. Shawn felt about Bret for like the 
complete opposite reasons. Like, dude, you're too stiff, man. Live life, man. Why are you so smug? Oh, 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 best of best, best of ever is. Like, like, dude, let your nuts hang, man. Like, why are you so serious all the time, man? Like, live life. Smoke a blunt, bro. Fucking drink. Take a shot, man. Damn, bro. Oh, like, yeah. So it's like, you know, Brett didn't like him for that reason. Like, man, you fucking, you're a goof. You're a kid. You're childish. Um, But yeah, man, I, I like the fact that Austin, uh, I think this was his return back in a full match, and he is... There, there's signs of Austin mania, even though we're in Montreal, Quebec, uh, you see the Austin 316 shirts all over the place. Um, you know, those Canadian fans, they were quick to turn off that Canadian loyalty. Like, I guess it only mattered in that one match because I, outside of Bret Hart, no other like Canadian was performing. Oh, Owen Hart. But even though he was facing Owen Hart, they were still cheering for Steve Austin. Yeah. So it's just like, I mean, the man has taken then, all the hearts and beating their ass in like publicly you know, he pulled, he almost pulled Stu over the fucking ring. If guy, if he wasn't asleep. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and, and you, you see some of the early elements of the rock coming into his own. He, he's got that people's elbow coming down the tornado DDT. He's, he's with the nation and you know, they're about to build off of that, man. Um, but any callbacks, honorable mentions or takeaways, good sir. I just want to point out how much like hate, makes people succeed look at that Shawn michaels people hated him look how big he got look at the rock people say his chant was you suck die rocky die and then he turned that around so hateration actually i guess haterade can power you steve um i don't really have any callbacks other than i showed you this and i just think it's interesting to show the fans as you know as a pack rat my parents have saved multiple things and i showed steve this but just to show how much they were bilking children back in the day, Tur Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the magazine, Steve. And uh, this is from 91. It features Donatello riding some sort of a dinosaur. Uh, you know, who knew about that? But it does feature a lot of like stuff about TV back in the day. And it mentions Back to the Future, the cartoon, which we've discussed. Yeah. Where's Waldo cartoon, which we've discussed. Uh, Darkwing <laughs> Duck and dinosaurs so you know if you were back in the 90s and you wanted to just know the the real deal you could consult teenage Mutant <laughs> ninja turtles the magazine and know what to watch um and i you could have been featured in the magazine's art section because you know these kids let's they weren't artistic geniuses let's put it like that man that one turtle looks like a penis head like yeah, I, I, it really, <laughs> It's uh, it's not looking hey. great. Bebop looks like he has Down syndrome, um, yeah. but spina bifida. I don't yeah. know. But, but they're kids' drawings. They're like, <laughs> all right, I'm gonna back off. I'm not. I mean, I could show you mine. It's actually up there. It looks like one of the drawings uh, that the kids made. But I just think it's funny. You know, look how prolific the turtles were. They even had their own magazine that wasn't. It was just like a, you know, what's going on in the turtles' lives. It's like in vogue, but for turtles. So shout out. What about you? <laughs> And as a turtle head, I, I didn't even know that such thing existed, man. I'm ashamed. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing I have, man, uh, in 1990, Quantum Leap is airing black on white on fire. This time around, Sam is a black man, and he's he's a black man in the like civil rights era, like the Watts riots oh, that are about to happen. And uh, <laughs> through, a couple of times throughout this episode, he's called an N-word by a black man. And I just found that hilarious because like when he's called an N-word, you see him as Sam. And it's just like this was 1990. A black guy calling a white guy an N-word, man. This is must-see TV. Thank you, NBC. But uh, that, that's that's, that's amazing. <laughs> amazing. They had. I wondered in my head when we watched these, like, did they ever go to a racist time? Did they ever go crazy racial with it? Because they they would do it anyway. So we should have watched that. I'm gonna watch that tonight it's, just because I have to see it. Yeah, I mean, we were covering wrestling so like adding an hour long episode like that's and tough. plus cch pounders in this episode uh oh, like it, it's about the oh, so yeah it's about the watch riots good? pound town man yeah it's about the watch riots but uh yeah that's all i got man please like share subscribe and comment say your sister that it's easy for me to see that her body's calling me check out food show fanatics and crush gasm with kendra every wednesday this is steve g and Maggie with happening in the 90. <laughs>
dick holes in them. 